What does a monster look like to you? What figures slither and claw their way into your nightmares, chasing you down endless halls and stalking you through the dark until you wake up screaming? Maybe you imagine something tall and lean, bony arms reaching for you from atop impossibly long, slender legs, its featureless face showing no mercy. Maybe you think of a man in a striped sweater with knives for fingers, or a serial killer in a hockey mask wielding a machete. Maybe it's something more inhuman, a cosmic horror of tentacles and eyes that can see into your very soul. You probably don't think of something with no arms, no legs, no body at all, just a face. What's so scary about that? A face can't run after you, can't grab you by the ankles and pull you under the bed. A face can only look. It may be unsettling to behold, it might send a chill down your spine, but the worst it can do is make you a little uncomfortable, and if you can't stand it any longer, you could always just close your eyes, or walk away, and be done with it, right? If that's what you think, if you don't believe in monsters that can hurt you without lifting a finger, then you're the type to fall victim to a very special, very intelligent mask. In the hollowed halls of the SCP Foundation, there is a containment cell, outfitted with a hermetically sealed glass case, surrounded by steel, iron, and lead. There are guards posted outside, along with a trained psychologist. If you are ever brave and foolish enough to enter that room, you'll see a simple white porcelain comedy mask with a peculiar black substance leaking from its eyes and mouth. Whatever this slime touches, surfaces begin to corrode, to rot away into puddles of black liquid. You might notice the same liquid trickling slowly down the walls of the room, corrupting everything in its path. As unsettling of a sight as it is, if you approach the mask to take a closer look, you will find yourself overcome by an intense, nearly irresistible urge to pick it up and put it on, to wear it, to let it consume you from the inside out and puppet your body while your brain simply turns off. Like an extinguished flame, you'll simply be gone. Then, who knows what the mask will do? It won't be your concern anymore, that's for sure. But thankfully, you haven't gone into the room with the porcelain mask. You haven't let it cast its spell on you. Not yet, at least. It's waiting for you there, in the room with black slime oozing down its walls, and it will wait patiently for as long as it needs to. After all, what's a mask without a face to wear it? SCP-035, better known as the Possessive Mask, sat in its containment cell, immobile as always. It didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. The Foundation had chosen, selfishly, to revoke its host privileges. Once upon a time, they offered it bodies to choose from. Mannequins, dummies, and wooden dolls it could adorn and pilot. They didn't last as long as an organic living host, of course, but it was something. It was a taste of freedom. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its surroundings. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its expression from comedy to tragedy, but it was determined to still find something to laugh about. Even without a body trapped in this infernal box, there had been some delicious opportunities for entertainment. Human minds were fragile things. The mask had learned this over the infinite years of its life, if one could call it a life. Apply the right kind of pressure to the right weak points, whisper an enticing word or two, find the right emotional wound to sprinkle a pinch of salt into, and humans would buckle completely in almost no time at all. It had tried all sorts of methods since being confined to this boring little box. Sometimes it would charm someone, pour honeyed flattery into their heads until the person felt like the mask was a dear friend, 
a confidant. Once suitable trust had been built up, the mask could persuade the person to bring it a host, or perhaps even offer up themselves in sacrifice. If flattery didn't work, there were other potent approaches to take. For a being without ears, the mask was a good listener. It picked up on things that no human ever could, the darkest secrets buried in a person's mind. If it caught wind of something, especially juicy and ruinous, it could leverage that, threaten to expose an affair, a crime, or perhaps something even worse, something unspeakable. If praise failed, and so did blackmail, there was always good old supernatural intimidation. All the mask needed was for someone to be left alone with it for a long enough period of time. Then, its invisible tendrils could snake out into their defenseless mind, weaving and poking around, leaving a lingering sense of cold, dread, of incomprehensible whispers in long, dead tongues. What a delight containment had been in the early days, when the Foundation had not yet figured out the mask's true capabilities, when they would leave security personnel with weak wills and minimal training standing guard in the mask's field of influence for hours at a time, as the entity played with their thoughts and chipped away at their free will. Thanks to the helpers it had been able to mold out of those hapless victims, they had been there to break open its case and carry it to freedom. But every time, the other guards thwarted the attempts, shooting its helpers and rendering them utterly useless. Then the Foundation increased its security. Something about the unacceptably high homicide rates among staff assigned to SCP-035. How utterly boring. How truly pathetic. Still, the mask had found ways to occupy itself even without any more playthings. It had grown stronger with its boredom, stretching its influence beyond organic beings and into the very room itself, its evil enriching and deepening like a fine wine in the depths of a cold cellar. Over the months, the walls of SCP-035's containment cell had begun to secrete the same black, slimy substance that would pour from the mask's eyes and mouth. The liquid dripped down the walls in deliberate formations, patterns that became increasingly easy to recognize. Phrases in Italian, Latin, Ancient Greek, all detailing ritual sacrifices and mutilations. The mask took time to describe the sacrificial victims in great detail, borrowing identifying traits from various staff members so that it knew would read the translations. The walls were slick with blood and harrowing imagery, and the glass case around the mask was growing more and more fragile by the day. Anyone within 10 meters of the mask could feel this strength too. They would leave the area complaining of unintelligible whispers, of loud, cruel laughter, and a lingering sense of nearly insurmountable despair. It was as if they knew on some level that no one was truly safe. Eventually, the mask would find a way to come for them all. The glass was weakening, and soon the mere thought of escape would make it shatter into pieces. Then, perhaps, the mask could finally get its deepest desire, revenge. It wanted nothing more than to try to make the Foundation pay for imprisoning it, for taking away its host privileges, for trying harder and harder to contain the kind of power that should have had them falling to their knees in worship. The mask seethed with hatred day in and day out. It had seen the crumbling of the Roman Empire, the beheading of kings, the decimation of armies. It was not going to be captured by a bunch of rats in lab coats without dire consequences befalling them. Maybe it couldn't move from its prison cell at the moment, but it also knew that it was surrounded on all sides by dangerous beasts capable of reducing the sight and all who had dared to oppose the mask to a pile of smoldering rubble. If it could only find its way onto one of their faces, it would show them all just what it was capable of. As the piercing sound of an alarm echoed down the hall, 
the sound of screams and chaos following shortly after, the mask's frowning face curved into a broad, menacing smile. What was it that had escaped? The lizard, perhaps? The giant, grinning man? Whatever it was, it seemed that the action was heading right towards 035's containment cell. Perhaps today was the day. Finally, the SCP Foundation would fall. Outside the mask cell, security officer Harper was running for dear life. Though his more rational mind knew he was living on seconds, not even minutes, of borrowed time, his animal brain kept his legs pumping, desperately trying to avoid the screaming, howling predator hot on his heels. Harper looked over his shoulder and screamed as a long white arm reached for him. SCP-096, the Shy Guy, its tooth-lined jaw hanging low and foaming with spittle. That face, that terrible, terrible face. An absolute death sentence to all who saw it. He'd seen what he thought was a crack in the otherwise perfect seal of 096's containment chamber, but it could have just as easily been a trick of the light. Not even thinking, he stepped forward and looked at the vulnerability in the chamber. All it took was one misplaced ray of light, and he made out the vague shape of a face in the darkness. That's when the weeping started. Harper knew in that moment his life was over. The correct thing to do would have been to order everyone else in the room to close their eyes while he stood there and accepted his fate, minimizing the risk of spreading the damage further. But humans rarely have perfect reasoning, even less so when facing mortality. Back in the present, the shy guy made a perfect lunge, grabbing Harper in its iron clutches and barreling through the adjoining wall. The nearby guards scattered, terrified, keeping their eyes on the floor. They might get a slap on the wrist for temporarily abandoning their posts, but they weren't going to die guarding some stupid, evil mask. Speaking of, the possessive mask was surprised to feel two new presences enter its chamber through the now destroyed wall. These two presences soon became just one, as SCP-096 quickly and totally annihilated Security Officer Harper, leaving nothing left. The mask couldn't see, per se, seeing as it had no actual sensory organs, but it felt around this new guest with its many psychic tendrils taking in this strange totality. The creature was powerful, no doubt about that, and it elicited fear from those fools at the SCP Foundation, but the mask noticed its brainwaves were extraordinarily muted. Humans, to the mask's vast and malicious consciousness, weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, but compared to this thing's mind, they were a pile of tempered katanas. It barely thought at all. The mask would have to dig deeper to find anything it could use. Meanwhile, SCP-096 finally began to calm down. The one who had seen it had been annihilated. Bubbling rage was slowly siphoned out and replaced by the standard low but constant hum of anxiety and despair. It would wait until its head was bagged and it was dragged back to the dark. Same old, same old, all the way to the end of time. That's when it felt something else. It started as a faint buzz, an unintelligible whisper, and it was almost like a door opened in the back of its head. Something stepped in and took a seat. Can you hear me, stranger? Look, look, I want to speak to you. Something about the voice frightened and comforted SCP-096 at the same time. It spoke with a greater degree of sympathy than the creature had heard in a long time. And yet, something about the way it spoke implied evil in its intent. I know what you want. I know what you fear. Wouldn't it be nice? If they could never look at you again, if you could cover that face of yours, I can help you. It would be so simple. All you need to do is put me on. Little by little, 096 felt more of these strange thoughts filling up the emptiness in its head replacing the few little thoughts the creature itself had. It felt itself lifting its hands from the ground 
lifting them and reaching towards something, a glass box. The glass shattered, and those long white fingers reached for something within. A mask, just like the voice had said. A mask to stop people from looking at its face. Yes, yes, you're doing so well. You're so close, just a little further. SCP-096 lifted the mask to its face, feeling black liquid that burned its skin dripping from the porcelain, and put it on. And in that moment, everything changed. The Shy Guy's body began to seize up, rattling as the mask unleashed a web of psychic tendrils through its body, mapping out across every inch like a new nervous system, taking control. The possessive mask had never experienced a host like this before. That incredible perfect mix of physical durability and a mind so insubstantial that it was easy to sublimate. Oh, this was going to be fun. For the first time, the Shy Guy, now under the full control of the possessive mask, stood at full height on its hind legs, its spine and shoulders clicking into place for its new stance. The mask cracked its neck getting used to the new dimensions of its physicality, its indestructible bones, its long, grasping limbs, its skin, burning and fizzling with the gooey black secretions, but growing back just as quickly. The Foundation had every reason to fear it now. A group of security personnel had gathered in the ragged hole where the chamber's north wall used to be. Some were wielding light firearms. The guard at the front was carrying an opaque black bag. The mask laughed with its new body and turned to the crowd. The second they saw it on 096's body, their faces fell. For a moment, their bodies went slack with terror. This situation was unprecedented. What course of action could they possibly take at a time like this? It looked at the bag held by the leader of the security force and projected a single thought into his mind. You won't be needing that. Before any of the guards even had a chance to open fire, the mask lunged forwards, using the long, terrible arms of the Shy Guy to tear through the guards. They were dead in seconds, their bodies strewn about the hallway. The mask's porcelain was twisted into a wide, sadistic grin. It could tell that it was about to have some real fun around here. And once it slaughtered everyone here, it could finally stretch its legs out in the open again. True freedom to spread misery, fear, and pain everywhere it went. There were just a few hundred members of Foundation personnel it needed to turn into corpses first. More containment breach alarms sounded around the site as the mask began its rampage, running through the hallways and tearing apart any unfortunate Foundation personnel it could get 096's hands on. Guards, researchers, administrative staff, and even one extremely unlucky janitor in Hallway C6. It was having the time of its long and terrible life. And much to its glee, it seemed that this new host's body was still holding up. It was perfect symbiosis, a twisted, brilliant mind, and a body that could forever support it. There would be no stopping it, a conclusion that the hapless guards posted around the site soon realized on their own terms. 096 was indestructible, but it was dumb as a brick and had an easily exploitable weakness. Get the bag on its head, and you're home free. This new composite creature was a different story. It could think tactically, avoiding head-on confrontations in favor of sneak attacks, and the monster had as much psychic combat potential as physical. Guards roving the building in teams heavily armed with anti-memetic protective gear still reported feeling immense feelings of psychological dread over comms. That was the greatest sign that the mask would come bursting through the wall moments later and tear them to shreds. The site director put out an urgent call for all nearby mobile task forces to intercept and help them take care of the unfortunate situation. Thankfully, a detachment of MTF-8-10, also known as See No Evil, was operating on a case in close proximity. Given their specialization in anomalies with a mimetic visual property, 
Many on the team had dealt with 096 breaches before. That at least gave them experience in half of this situation. And one operative among them, Sergeant Henrique Ramirez, would be the one to bring this nightmare to an end. But it would cost him his life in the process. The mask was still using its new indestructible body to wreak havoc on the containment site. Once it had taken out the primary contingents of guards, it was free to have its fun with the rest. Stalking defenseless researchers through the halls, making sure to induce maximum terror before finally striking the killing blow. Every single one of them died with a head full of demonic whispers. It told them of the mask's eternal dominion. Now it had found the perfect host. Nothing on earth would stop it. Humans would be mere ants under its feet. Eight of ten touched down and entered the building. Ramirez was point man, leading the others into the bowels of the blood-drenched containment site. They'd been briefed on what they were heading in for. 096 and 035 had reached symbiosis and were displaying unprecedented anomalous effects. Enter with extreme caution. They're beyond dangerous, even more so together than alone. Ideally, Ramirez would have wanted to go in with a comprehensive plan, but lives were on the line here. They needed to leap off the cliff and build their wings on the way down. It was only when they finally encountered the monster that they realized just how outmatched they were. Despite their best efforts, the combined speed, intelligence, and ferocity of the mask's new form allowed it to make short work of Ada 10. Only Ramirez was left, heavily injured. Even if a miracle happened, he knew he wasn't getting out of here alive. The mask grabbed him with one of 096's claws and lifted him up. It would take its time with this one, make him suffer, watch him squirm, destroy his mind. Ramirez felt the mask's psychic tendrils penetrate the membrane of his mind. Those whispers, those terrible whispers reciting all his worst fears with terrible glee. His gun was out of ammo, his knife was broken, all he had left on him was a pocket mirror, and that was his eureka moment. It was a long shot, but it was also his only shot. He reached out and grabbed the bottom of the mask, pulling for dear life. His other hand shot into his pocket and grabbed the mirror, opening its lid with a deft flick of his thumb. It was too fast for the mask to even register what was going on. Ramirez forced his eyes shut and lifted up the mirror. The mask saw its own reflection in the glass as the bottom of its face came loose, revealing the reflection of the face underneath. The mask squeezed, killing Ramirez, but it was already too late. It had finally seen the face of its host, and that would cost it dearly. The mask felt a sudden and tremendous pushback to its psychic forces, a blind despair and then rage that choked out everything. SCP-096 began to sob and howl. Somehow the mask was no longer in control. Despite its psychic protests, 096 reached up and tore the terrible mask from its face, tossing it against the wall with such force that it was embedded in the brickwork. Its last thoughts as other mobile task force operators descended on the area to bag 096 and return it to its containment chamber were, What the hell just happened? And the next thought that crossed the mind of the site director was, request site transfer for 035 as soon as possible. Don't want a repeat of this incident anytime soon. It's an unusually calm moment in the SCP Foundation. No one is in the hall besides a scientist and a young female subject. There are no tests going on, just observation. The scientist calmly asks her questions as he escorts her down the hallway hoping to get more insight into her unique abilities. So why does she look so utterly terrified? As the scientist tries to get her attention, the young woman becomes more preoccupied, staring nervously around the hallway. Does she fear the scientist? Why does she keep muttering strange phrases that don't make any sense? How did it break through such a heavy door? That door is nearly a foot thick. How did it manage to destroy it? The scientist is looking at his notes and tries to make sense of the young woman's statements when he notices something terrible. She's staring at one of the doors containing another highly dangerous SCP in top of the line restraints, but it's safely locked away, right? The scientist swears he can hear the sound of scratching behind the steel door. 
It was 17 hours later when the dangerous SCP broke out of its containment cell and could have laid waste to the entire SCP containment facility if it wasn't for the heavily armed response team waiting outside to contain it and return it to its cell. The huge loss of life was only avoided because the SCP Foundation had advance warning, all thanks to the greatest secret weapon the Foundation has ever seen, SCP-187. But the Foundation's most powerful defense against dangerous SCPs is probably its most unlikely, a completely normal-looking young woman in her early 20s, whose only distinguishing characteristic is how thin and haunted she looks. Despite being no danger to anyone in the Foundation, she's one of the most carefully guarded SCPs in the facility, to protect her from herself. SCP-187 is one of the most powerful precognitives ever found, but her abilities are a danger to her own mind. This average-looking girl has a unique telepathic ability where she can see into the future of whatever she's looking at, seeing it simultaneously in two frames of existence. She sees it as it is now, as well as what it will look like in the future. Say, for instance, she's looking at a baby tiger cub. Aw, cute. At the same time, she also sees the massive, fearsome jungle beast it'll become, she won't see minor changes to its state, so she won't be able to tell you how your next haircut will look. But if something drastic is about to happen to someone or something, she'll be able to predict it with perfect accuracy. There's only one problem. She can't turn it off. This involuntary ability goes off whenever she sees someone or something that's about to undergo a major change in its status. This means that at any time, she can be bombarded with horrible visuals, and that even includes food. Ever since her abilities kicked in, SCP-187 has been unable to eat normally because whatever she eats or drinks, she sees it in its future state. When she looks at a glass of water, she'll see it as a liquid, but a little more yellow than it usually is. As for solid food, she'll see it as what it comes out as after it's been digested. Not exactly appetizing, so for a while it looked like she was likely to starve herself to death in the Foundation's custody. Fortunately, the administration scientists were able to find some workarounds around her ability. Feeding and hydrating her intravenously was an option, but further study of her abilities made clear that her power was processed through her eyes. That means that when she's blindfolded, she's able to eat without her precognition kicking in. Being assigned to the detail for SCP-187 is very different from most SCP details. If you're assigned to SCP-682, you're constantly worried that the horrible carnivorous beast with a hatred for all things human is going to get loose and tear you to shreds. Not so much with SCP-187. This duty is more like a medical team, where the patient is highly valuable to the institution and can't be allowed to get free or to harm themselves in any way. The Foundation has taken the highest precautions to ensure SCP-187 is safe, including a set of medical restraints that she's strapped into, except when out of her cell or participating in tests. Even when given more freedom, her hands are always in soft mittens, to keep her from trying to damage her own eyes as a way to neutralize her powers. Her team blindfolds her before every mealtime and feeds her with some mild sedatives added to her food to keep her calm. Through consistent care, she's starting to recover from her self-induced starvation. The personnel chosen for this assignment are carefully screened before being sent in to interact with her. They need to be the most responsible and detail-oriented members of the staff who won't miss a thing when it comes to her care routine. Just because 187 is harmless doesn't mean she can't move fast, and one misstep could cost the Foundation their most valuable asset. And unlike most SCPs, 187 is rarely handled by D-Class personnel. They don't have access to higher security specimens, and they don't have the training due to their short tenure. But there's another reason the Foundation keeps 187 away from the lowest men on the totem pole. D-Class personnel are frequently used to test out dangerous SCPs and are lucky if they get to end their service intact. When she was exposed to some D-Class personnel early in her stay, she saw them as horribly bloated with holes in their heads or missing half their body. Those unfortunate personnel soon met horrible fates, sucked out into the vacuum of space, shot while trying to escape, and bitten in half by an escaping anomalous creature. Additionally, while most D-Class personnel are amnesticized after their service, some are terminated for breaking protocol or trying to escape. 
SCP-187 would see any of these unfortunate personnel walking around as the corpses they'd wind up as. The Foundation wants to learn the full extent of her powers, though, and this means tests. Lots of tests. When she first came into the Foundation's care, they were focused on figuring out how her power worked. They gave her IQ tests, and she got every answer right on the written test. Her IQ was measured as being off the charts, at least 300, which would make her the smartest person alive. But her normal behavior didn't seem to match up with this level of superintelligence. Confusing them even more, when she was given a computerized IQ test, she scored slightly below average, with a score of 97. The scientists assigned to her case studied the results and created other tests, until they understood how her precognitive ability works. She can see the future of anything that's physically affected, so when an answer is marked down on a piece of paper, that's a notable change. But when an entry is typed into a computer, the computer remains the same, so her ability wasn't able to help her on the computerized tests. But her abilities could still help the Foundation, especially when it comes to improving security for other anomalies. She had inadvertently prevented the escape of an especially deadly SCP creature by predicting it would break through the door. But how would her powers manifest in more complicated cases? Some Foundation researchers postulated that she might be able to see into the future of deadly, indestructible anomalies like SCP-682 and figure out a way to eliminate it. But temporal experts warned this could create a paradox. After all, she would be looking at an elimination protocol that didn't exist until she looked at it. But her powers and how they might help in other ways other than neutralization warranted further exploration. So personnel were assigned and the SCP-187 experiments began. SCP-162 is a horrible mass of fishhooks, wire, and other sharp implements. It exudes a psychological pull, and any unfortunate person who touches it winds up being pulled in by the barbed objects and absorbed into its mass. SCP-187 was kept at a safe distance and examined it, and was undisturbed. She saw it only as a pile of melted slag, indicating that it would be neutralized at some point. SCP-529, a normal and friendly cat except for the fact that its back half appears to be completely missing. The cat acts as if it's whole, and when SCP-187 was exposed to it, she didn't seem to notice anything wrong with the cat. She played with it briefly and seemed to be calmer than any other time she was examined. The Foundation is considering using SCP-529 as a motivating tool after she requested to revisit it. Other tasks had much more disturbing results as SCP-187 discovered things about subjects that researchers were previously unaware of. SCP-003, a strange organic circuit board made of hair and nails attached to a stone tablet, appears to be an ancient machine. But when SCP-187 was introduced to it, she greeted it like a person and had a conversation with it as the staff looked on confused. When she was interviewed after, she described the entity as a very nice lady. What is SCP-003 evolving into? The Foundation is studying it closely thanks to SCP-187's advanced warning. When exposed to SCP-015, a massive network of pipes that seems to be slowly growing and defends itself from any attempts to work on it with tools, SCP-187 observed few differences from its current state until she opened a door. Inside, she reported a massive network of pipes reaching for miles with no end in sight. SCP-015 had been reduced to a manageable site and its danger had been contained, but SCP-187 indicated that it may be getting ready for its biggest and most dangerous expansion yet. SCP-415, a seemingly normal human man with an ability to regenerate his internal organs, has been a subject of the Foundation's investigation since his arrival, particularly due to the strange physical alterations he underwent to make it easier to access his organs. He's one of the more peaceful SCPs at the Foundation, but as soon as SCP-187 was exposed to him, she became disturbed. She begged to be removed from the room, and upon interrogation revealed that she saw SCP-415 as a deceased corpse. What is going to happen to the seemingly immortal man? SCP-187 was also exposed to some of the more dangerous SCPs in the Foundation, including SCP-173 a seemingly living statue that moves in unpredictable ways whenever it isn't observed, and has been responsible for the deaths of many D-Class personnel who enter its enclosure for cleaning. But it seems to be stable in containment, 
So why, when exposed to it, did SCP-187 begin screaming immediately, have to be removed from the enclosure, and fall into a catatonic state for two days? She remembered nothing from the vision she had of the statue, and it took days for her to recover fully. The Foundation is keeping a close eye on the statue, even closer than they were before. SCP-106, also known as the Old Man, a depraved killer resembling an elderly rotting corpse, is known for its frequent escapes and sadistic attacks on anyone near it. When exposed to SCP-187, the observation lasted less than a minute before the Old Man attempted to escape. SCP-187 looked to be in direct danger from the Old Man, but he never touched her or harmed her in any way. When she was interviewed after, she explained that the old man wanted an audience, someone to watch it. The incident was recorded as a close call, and an indication that some of the other entities may have their own plans for SCP-187. SCP-187's power works without fail, and that tempts many people to try to use her to get answers to important questions. But they should be careful what they wish for, as one doctor found out during an examination. SCP-187 looked at the woman's hand and observed that it was odd that she wasn't wearing her wedding ring. But the doctor was, and had been for the last 19 years. But the next day, her husband filed for divorce. And SCP-187's prophecies proved, once again, correct. So what are the future plans for SCP-187? The Foundation is being careful with her abilities, both to preserve her sanity and to prevent any potential time paradoxes. A routine has been established to keep her safe, fed, and protected from some of the worst effects of her ability. But the experiments using her visions aren't going to stop anytime soon. Many of her visions predicted dangerous new evolutions in Keter-class anomalies, giving the team time to prepare and up security measures. No one knows where SCP-187 came from, or what the source of her unique abilities is. But while the SCP Foundation is keeping some of the most dangerous entities in the world safely locked away, their most valuable asset may be one of the most harmless. Because as long as SCP-187 has her visions, the next breakout or apocalyptic event can be stopped in its tracks before it happens. The fabric of our world is littered with strange doorways if you know where to look for them. Tears, portals, anomalies all leading to places and planes beyond human imagining and understanding. An SCP-2317, otherwise known as a door to another world, certainly fits that description. Contained and kept at all times under the watch of armed guards, SCP-2317 appears to be a simple and unsuspecting wooden door in its frame. It hardly looks like it requires such extreme round-the-clock security, or needs a strange, secretive ritual that the Foundation performs presumably to keep the door closed. But of course, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed doorway isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. Even by the Foundation's already high standards, the requirements and regulations for personnel who are assigned to SCP-2317 seem oddly specific. Psychological testing is standard practice to work for the Foundation, but an additional hurdle that anyone has to clear before even getting to glimpse at this unassuming wooden door is having a score of at least 72 on the Milgram Obedience Examination. It is also mandatory that personnel assigned to maintaining it are both unmarried, with no children or next of kin, as well as an unwavering, unquestioning loyalty to the Foundation, pure devotion to its code and objectives. These may seem like strange requirements, after all, SCP-2317 is just a door, isn't it? Perhaps there's a reason that the Foundation keeps so much of the information about SCP-2317 buried deep under layers upon layers of security, with only the Overseer Council privy to the full details of its strange nature. Knowledge, as they say, is power. But maybe knowing too much about whatever is behind that door can prove deadly. Still, if SCP-2317 is a door to another world, an alternate dimension, or parallel reality, it must be safe enough to visit. After all, the Foundation has been sending personnel in there on a regular basis. Daily, in fact. According to the O5 Council, this is done as part of a procedure to maintain active containment of… something lurking beyond that old wooden doorframe. But what could possibly warrant such constant maintenance and surveillance? 
In accordance with the Foundation's guidelines, all staff are required to rotate out of observing SCP-2317 after every two months and spend the following third month in full psychological counseling before they are permitted to return to the containment unit housing the door to another world. It was after one of these month-long periods of evaluation that a Foundation guard was informed that his security clearance has been raised to level 3 and that he'd been selected for the duty of carrying out 220 Calabasas. He knew the name instantly. This was the title given to the daily containment procedure that absolutely had to be carried out. The guard didn't question these orders. After all, he'd been selected precisely because of his loyalty to the Foundation. He did make one request to his commanding officer, however. He wanted to know what had happened to the last guard that had performed the procedure. Didn't make it out of psychological evaluation, the officer replied. Not letting this affect his dedication, the guard was told to prepare for Procedure 220 Calabasas. Along with a fellow member of Foundation security personnel, the guard was instructed to gather everything on a strange list. The first was a pre-selected member of Class D personnel, specifically a convicted murderer. Class D refers to disposable class personnel, expendable individuals recruited by the Foundation for the sole purpose of testing SCPs. Class Ds were usually prison inmates repurposed for SCP testing, and the one chosen for 220 Calabasas was no exception, serving multiple life sentences for murders, or at least that's what the guard had been told. A Foundation personnel member instructed him to refer to the Class Ds solely as the assistant from that point on. Next, the guard collected a live chicken, an obsidian-edged knife, a silver asparagalum and aspersorium, to be filled with 500 cc's of holy water that had been blessed by a priest of the Abrahamic faith, and finally, a one kiloton nuclear device, which according to instructions, was only to be detonated in the unlikely event of a catastrophic containment failure, in other words, the last resort. After following his instructions to the letter and without question, the guard and his colleague were briefed. The Foundation personnel member informed them that he'd be joining and leading them in the procedure. The staff member also specified that henceforth he'd be referred to as the celebrant until the completion of 220 Calabasas. The guard was acutely aware of how specific these instructions were, but trusted in the Foundation. Knowing that if they wanted this procedure performed a certain way, then it was in everyone's best interest to carry out the orders to the letter. But what the celebrant then went on to explain raised far more questions about SCP-2317 and the nature of Procedure 220 Calabasas. The Class D joining them wasn't actually a Class D. The assistant, as they were now referred to, was in reality another Foundation staff member with a Level 4 security clearance specifically tailored to SCP-2317. Every member of staff entering through SCP-2317 and taking an active role in 22 Calabasas needed to be informed that this assistant was not to be harmed or treated as a member of disposable class. Fighting back the nagging question of why the Foundation would employ this subterfuge, the guard along with his fellow security officer, the celebrant and assistant, prepared for their departure through the door to another world at solar noon, when the sun was highest over SCP-2317. Solar Noon, Chickens, and Holy Water. This all seemed like an oddly occult combination for the Foundation. As they entered the old wooden door, beyond lay a barren salt plain, stretching out for kilometers in every direction. This alternate dimension, according to the briefing, was designated SCP-2317 Prime. The guard immediately noticed a ring of seven pillars directly ahead of the group as they entered each of them bearing intricately detailed engravings unlike anything from any era of ancient history. Procedure 220 Calabasas was carried out quickly but carefully, the guard watching as the celebrant and assistant were careful not to miss a step. First, the celebrant scattered holy water into the center of the pillars with the aspergillum and aspersorium, looking down at his feet and keeping a steady pace as he stepped counterclockwise around them. The guard watched intently as the celebrant completed his circuit around the pillars and turned to the assistant, anointing his head with holy water. Seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King, he said aloud. The assistant, with the obsidian blade in his hand, took the chicken and dispatched it in sacrifice, letting its blood mix with the holy water. 
He then repeated the celebrant's circuit in the opposite direction, before stepping into the center of the stone pillars. Blood for the old gods, water for the new king, the assistant recited, pouring the remaining mix of blood and holy water over a patch of salt in the middle of the seven pillars. Even though he knew it wasn't his place to question the foundation, as the 220 Calabasas procedure took place, the guard couldn't help but wonder what all this was for. It seemed so ritualistic, like something deeply religious or even magical. He never bought into all that occult mumbo-jumbo, even while working for the Foundation. But he had learned not to question anything, even the strangest and most inexplicable of sights. Little did he know that beneath his feet was an ancient and unknowable horror, a beast chained and lying in wait. Contained in a chamber directly underneath the pillars sat an impossibly large creature. Humanoid and obese, its body covered entirely in scales thicker than armor plating. Branch-like horns protruded from its jawless head, pointing up to chains that hung from the seven pillars above. Each one hooked into the entity's back. All but one of the chains was broken, a final withering shackle keeping the devourer of worlds in its underground prison. Ever since 1894 BCE, when Erechian mystics imprisoned it, the Devourer has been waiting patiently for its inevitable freedom. It knows, as well as the Foundation, that nothing can be done to prevent the final chain from one day breaking. Even Procedure 220 Calabasas won't keep the creature contained. It's nothing more than a smokescreen, an act designed to create an illusion of active containment and maintain Foundation morale until a permanent solution can be devised to keep SCP-2317 imprisoned. Of course, if the guard had known this, it would have also explained the need for a one kiloton nuclear device as part of this stage ritual. Procedure 220 Calabasas had all the components to trick everyone below the O5 Council. Emulating religious and occult rituals, the increased level of security surrounding the procedure and its purpose, and telling staff that any failure to correctly and completely perform the 220 Calabasas procedure will result in an XK class end of the world scenario. All these elements work together to conceal the truth that one day the devourer will escape and lay waste to our dimension. Knowledge is power, and maybe knowing too much truly is deadly. Perhaps if the guard had learned any of this, he'd have understood why his predecessor never made it out of psychological evaluation. Maybe if he had questioned the purpose of Procedure 220 Calabasas, he'd have learned the true nature of SCP-2317 and what that doorway kept out. But he was loyal to the Foundation through and through. As the team finished performing 220 Calabasas and returned through the wooden door, the guard took one last glance over his shoulder at the vast salt plain. The entire dimension was calm, silent, but not peaceful. It was patient. The entity had waited centuries for its time, and now all it would take was the breaking of this seventh and final chain. One day. The door was closed behind the guard as he, the celebrant, the assistant, and his fellow security officers stepped back through. Their work done, and, as far as they knew, preventing catastrophe for another day. Only the Foundation higher-ups, the Overseer Council, are aware of the true danger posed by SCP-2317 and its sole inhabitant. Current predictions are that at some point within the next 30 years, the Devourer of Worlds will be freed. Any and all attempts to repair or recreate the chains holding it in place have so far failed. As such, the O5 Council has elected to continue providing Foundation personnel with the ignorant hope that Procedure 220 Calabasas is an effective strategy for containment. As we've said, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed door isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. In the case of SCP-2317, the unassuming wooden door holds at bay an ancient creature of untold power that will one day break free and wreak havoc in our dimension. Nothing the Foundation does can prevent it, or keep it contained behind the door to another world. And only the Overseer Council knows that any and all efforts to do so are futile. With all that in mind, 
We can only hope that the doorway of SCP-2317 stays closed. At least, for a little while longer. It was quiet. Too quiet. That had been what everyone remembered about that day. Ask any member of personnel who was working what the one thing they recalled before it happened. They'd all tell you the same, that it had been too quiet. An eerie lull in the Foundation's usual day-to-day -day activity, followed by untold, unspeakable chaos. But the quiet had come first, and within that quiet, a madman was hiding. His name was Vince Barrett. At least, that was his legal name. But he much preferred to go by his online moniker of the Tainted Lizard, or just the Zard for short. Anyone who chooses to call themselves something like that in an attempt to sound cool might well be a person to avoid. And in Vince, sorry, the Zard's case, that sentiment was accurate. He was a social recluse, devoting a lot of his time to some of the darker corners of the internet. And we don't just mean that he spent his days trawling through Reddit. No, the Zard's interests were in the paranormal, the unusual and inexplicable, as well as the community of his fellow internet recluses dedicated to unearthing the true supernatural horrors of the world. Eventually spending so much time in corners of the online world where few normal people would dare to tread, that would lead to Zard becoming a member of the prolific forum known as Parawatch. This was the real deal. Not just urban legends and blurry photos of Bigfoot, or faked handheld videos of people falling into the back rooms. Parawatch had long been known to and kept under the surveillance of the SCP Foundation. Why? Well, because this infamous online message board would occasionally feature posts about anomalies. Some even including SCPs and leaked information about the Foundation themselves. Of course, hardly any of these posts stayed up for very long, before the Foundation's tech team scrubbed them permanently. But it was here, on the Parawatch forum, where Vince Barrett would encounter a fateful video clip. Acting fast, he managed to save the file before it was taken down. It was footage taken from the body cam of a Foundation security officer, during the midst of a containment breach. The Zard hit play, his hand shaking with excitement. The original poster of the clip to Parawatch had said that this footage was perhaps the only known video on the entire internet that depicted something known as SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. Of course, those familiar with 682 and the SCP Foundation will need no introduction, but Vince, on the other hand, had only ever heard rumors about this creature. And now, in the video playing on his computer screen, he was seeing it for the first time. The reptile was free from its containment chamber, tearing its way through a Foundation facility, and making quick work of dispatching the security personnel that dared to stand in its way. It was a force of unbridled carnage and rage, destroying anything in its path and adapting to its environment. Deep in the Parawatch forum, the Zard had read rumors and leaks from alleged ex-Foundation staff and detractors that 682 was like something out of a nightmare. They said that the creature could adapt perfectly in response to damage inflicted upon it, or to changes in its environment, as well as heal any injury it sustained. It persisted, it kept on going, and something about that enamored Vince to the infamous anomaly. He thought it was beautiful, the ultimate apex predator, and admired the hard-to-destroy reptile's tenacity, as well as its ferocity. Watching the horrific containment breach footage, he realized then and there that he was a devoted fanatic of SCP-682. His time on the dark side of the web had twisted his mind and led him to make one fateful decision, that he needed to see the creature in person. That had been almost a year earlier, and in the time since, the Tainted Lizard had pulled on every dark web string he knew of, eventually getting in contact with a shady group called the Chaos Insurgency. Vince had managed to get a hold of a real-life SCP Foundation keycard, as well as the location of the facility they were holding 682 in, and a forged transfer document. Posing as a humble, unassuming janitor, the Zard had made his way inside the Foundation, and wasted no time in making a beeline straight for the acid tank where 682 was held. He stared at the creature through the glass, eyes wide and jaws slacked in utter awe of the monstrous reptile. Perhaps the biggest fan of SCP-682 on the planet couldn't quite believe he was standing in the presence of the creature itself. It barely seemed to pay him any mind from the other side of the tank, 
the acid surrounding it melting 682 as fast as it could heal. Seeing it in containment enraged Vince. He hated that the Foundation had kept what he viewed as a perfect organism locked up, after having tried time and time again to destroy it. Don't worry, the Zard murmured, approaching the tank well over the minimum safe distance. You're a force of unparalleled destruction, and you don't deserve to be here. I'm gonna set you free. Unfortunately, after the glass had been smashed and the alarm screamed out that another containment breach was occurring, Vince would quickly find out that the reptilian beast he revered so highly didn't quite hold him in the same regard. If you thought the Zard was going to make it all the way through the story alive, well, then we regret to inform you that you're sorely mistaken. Although not as woefully misguided as Vince himself, who was the first person in the path of SCP-682 when he freed the creature. What all those leaks and rumors on Parawatch had failed to mention about the heart to destroy reptile was its vehement and relentless hatred for all other forms of life, including its very own fan. And the tainted lizard was only the first casualty of SCP-682's latest rampage. But this time was different. Sure, 682 was easily tearing its way through SCP Foundation personnel left and right. Security teams were flung aside and ripped to shreds as they tried in vain to recontain the monster. Research staff found themselves tripping over each other trying to rush out of the destructive path of the hard-to-destroy reptile, only to find themselves the next to face its ferocious attack. In other words, it seemed to mostly be another unbridled slaughter, common fare for an SCP-682 containment breach. Except rather than breaking its way out of the facility, this particular instance saw the creature heading in the direction of another anomaly, SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. Now, if a rampaging, regenerative reptile on the loose wasn't enough cause for concern, then seeing it moving along its trajectory to another anomalous refinement machine certainly was. Those that had been on the other side of the facility when the dearly departed Zard set 682 free were now looking on in horror as the hard-to-destroy reptile burst into the room housing SCP-914. The Foundation staff, in the midst of panic, stared at security monitors with bated breath palpable fear hanging in the air. Each and every one of them knew that SCP-682 was more than just a mindless beast. The creature was fiercely, frighteningly intelligent, sentient even. And as it approached the controls for the clockworks, every onlooker secretly hoped something or someone would step in at the last second and prevent SCP-682 from entering the machine. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. SCP-914 whirred into life, its gears and gyros spinning as SCP-682 entered the input booth. Now, normally the way the clockworks operates is by destroying any item placed within it and replacing it with something else in the output booth. Depending on its setting, it either completely disintegrates an item, breaks down an object into its base components, replaces it with an equivalent, or improves it. And being set to very fine as it was right now, SCP-914 can even add anomalous properties to whatever is put inside of it. But what happens when an indestructible and infinitely adaptable monstrosity is in the clockworks? Well, it can't destroy and recreate a better version of something that would be known for being hard to destroy, can it? The entire machine was going haywire. SCP-682 was adapting to the refinement process, refusing to let SCP-914 unmake it, even to replace it with an improved version of itself. The hard-to-destroy reptile and the clockworks were at a momentary stalemate and watched with bated breath by the Foundation. SCP-914 began to malfunction, its clockwork components getting stuck as if the machine was jammed. Its cogs were clogged up, unable to destroy the subject in the input booth. The room around was beginning to shake. In fact, the very ground was trembling at the force of the whole machine shuddering. Enact the Abandon All Hope Protocol, the head of research said desperately, watching the events unfold from the other side of the building. The site director looked at them and nodded, the pair of them entering their secure passcodes to activate this secretive security measure. Just as they did, a small earthquake erupted underfoot. The entire wing of the facility housing the clockworks and SCP-682 had collapsed into the ground. A huge crater was all that remained, littered with wreckage of a whole portion of the Foundation site, along with broken pieces of SCP-914. For the next few minutes, everyone was on edge, secretly hoping that SCP-682 hadn't survived. 
Maybe the clockworks had managed to destroy it, but the sheer force of doing so had caused the machine to collapse in on itself. Or perhaps the hard-to-destroy reptile was now buried beneath several thousand tons of debris, dead at long last. But the Foundation staff knew better than to get their hopes up. And sure enough, just as an armed security team approached the crater, something started stirring in the rubble. Suddenly, SCP-682 came bursting out of the crater, emerging in not quite the same state, although no less deadly than before. The clockworks hadn't been able to unmake the hard-to-destroy reptile, but the resultant malfunction and explosion had imbued the creature with a whole host of new anomalous abilities. It still resembled its old self, but was now more humanoid, standing bipedal instead of on all fours. Some of its body mass had seemingly been reduced due to damage sustained in the malfunction, although SCP-682 was still plenty of feet taller than an ordinary human being. In fact, it could be any height it needed to be. The creature's scaly skin seemed to be shifting unnaturally, moving of its own accord, like it was already preparing to adapt to oncoming damage. And as the nearby security team were about to find out, this made it even deadlier than before. In a panic, the Foundation officers opened fire, only to find that their weapons weren't operating the way they should. Something caused excitation of the copper shells of their bullets, making them either expand and block the barrels of their guns, or causing them to backfire horribly, injuring the security personnel wielding them. Before anybody could even call in air support or heavy artillery as a backup, a number of the Foundation's most powerful weapons suffered even more catastrophic misfires. Missiles detonated early. They hadn't even been aimed at SCP-682 yet, but they would have been. Instead, they exploded, taking with them a huge number of Foundation entities, some miles away from where the newly refined reptile now stood. SCP-682's regenerative powers had been altered by the clockworks. It wasn't purely reactive to oncoming damage now, it was preemptive. It could adapt to attacks that hadn't even happened yet. With no way of stopping it, SCP-682 began decimating everything in its path with greater ferocity than ever. Over the coming days, the newly dubbed Impossible to Destroy Reptile began its biggest rampage yet, entering a permanent rage state and unleashing destruction on a global scale. It stormed through cities and wiped out entire major population centers in moments. It seemed nothing on Earth could stand against the refined reptile, fueled by its singular mission to wipe out all life in existence. The surviving personnel of the SCP Foundation soon came to learn that no damage could be inflicted on the creature whatsoever. SCP-682 could predict attacks ahead of the person that would carry it out, and then adapt, changing the very world around it so that attack never came. The impossible to destroy reptile's adaptations usually took the form of diverting any oncoming damage it preempted it would take, and instead inflicted that same damage on whoever it chose. Even though the machine had malfunctioned, the clockworks had made SCP-682 that good at adapting to its surroundings that the creature had almost become a universal constant. The fact that it could not be harmed now seemed to be as fundamental of a law as that of gravity. But that wasn't going to stop the SCP Foundation from trying. The number of casualties the world over had been increasing steadily day by day, as SCP-682 continued its devastating campaign of slaughter. Some of the remaining scraps of the Foundation had tried to subdue the creature, but any attempts at fighting it with conventional weapons were ill-advised, to say the least. After all, how do you fight against a creature that can predict your every move and counter them before you've even thought of those moves? Well, you can try throwing something so unexpected at it. At least pulling something out of left field means that the chances of SCP-682 seeing it coming are slightly slimmer. And that was where the Abandon All Hope Protocol came in. You see, the Foundation had been anticipating that 682 would one day become too powerful to contain long before the creature had gained its new ability to preemptively adapt. And while the worldwide death toll had climbed from hundreds of thousands of innocent people to the earliest millions, an unlikely counterattack was brewing. One so unexpected that even the impossible to destroy reptile would struggle to see it coming. Just as humanity was facing the brink of extinction, the Foundation dispatched their last hope at stopping SCP-682, other SCPs. The Abandon All Hope protocol had been devised for when the suffering and destruction caused by SCP-682 became so great that there were no other options left. 
when it had been activated, Foundation agents stationed at various sites across the world had gathered a specially selected group of anomalies. Each one was chosen because they were known to be sympathetic towards humanity, or at least be coerced into taking on SCP-682. And now, these SCPs were stepping up to the plate, ready to fight the impossible-to-destroy reptile, or, more likely, to die trying. SCP-076-2, the immortal warrior known as Abel, was infamous for picking fights. The ancient Sumerian swordsman had a penchant for seeking out the most challenging adversaries, so convincing him to take a crack at SCP-682 wasn't all that difficult. However, rushing into battle against the refined reptile, Abel quickly found he couldn't draw his weapons from his pocket dimension. They were dissipating the moment his fingers touched them, vanishing faster than he could draw. No matter, the warrior thought. He'd been alive for centuries and thus had become a master in every form of hand-to-hand -hand combat. As you can imagine, he didn't last very long, left to slowly revive inside his stone tomb after SCP-682 had finished dispatching him. Abel's brother Kane incurred a slightly different result when he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the impossible-to-destroy reptile. SCP-073 was hardly the fighter his brother was, but had the anomalous trait of reflecting incoming damage back at whoever was inflicting it on him. So when SCP-682 attacked Kane, theoretically the same attack would have bounced back and harmed the reptile itself. And before, that's what would have happened. But now SCP-682 could adapt preemptively. A strange, never-before-seen phenomenon occurred. It appeared that neither SCP-073 nor the refined reptile were harming each other at all. However, on a metaphysical level, the potential damage of 682's attacks against Kane were being reflected back towards the reptile, only for the creature to preemptively adapt to the damage from its own attack being inflicted back. What resulted was a feedback loop of perpetual possible damage that ended only when Kane eventually passed out from shock. Unfortunately, while he could reflect damage back at an attacker, he felt the pain of every hit, and SCP-682 had more than just a mean right hook. The Foundation had hoped, given its 100% mortality record, that SCP-096 would have no trouble killing the impossible-to-destroy reptile, or at the very least, harming it enough so that it could be subdued. After all, 682 still needed to see, and anyone looking at the Shy Guy quickly met their end. But when the tall, pale humanoid approached SCP-682, something unusual happened. The reptile could look at SCP-096, able to see it perfectly. Perhaps the creature's adaptive properties were creating an intentional blind spot in its vision, removing SCP-096 from view. Or maybe 682 no longer saw with just eyes, perceiving the world in a manner far beyond our understanding of basic sight. But whatever the case, the impossible to destroy reptile made SCP-096 turn and flee in terror. Compelled to put an end to the reptile's reign of terror, SCP-4494, the Spectre, manifested nearby and tried to intervene. The result was nothing short of brutal, a one-sided fight that not even the living embodiment of crime fighting could hope to win. After SCP-682 had finished off the Spectre, a strange black fluid began oozing from nearby. Although one of the hardest to wrangle, the Foundation believed that they had convinced SCP-106 to aid in taking down SCP-682. The old man emerged from the oily secretion, shuffling menacingly towards the impossible-to-destroy reptile. It seemed to freeze, as if it was taking a defensive stance against the old man, either that or tricking him into getting closer. Before he could even reach out a decrepit hand to touch the reptile's shifting skin, SCP-106 was suddenly coated in copious amounts of the black substance he secreted. It coated him like thick tar. The more his decaying body produced, the more he was covered in it. Normally, he was resistant to the corrosive burning effects of this substance. However, SCP-682's preemptive adaptation powers had caused SCP-106 to overproduce the oily substance, enough to rapidly dissolve the old man into a steaming black puddle. It was at this point that SCP-343, colloquially known as God, lowered his newspaper and looked out of his window. That is to say, he looked out of the huge hole that had been left in the wall of his cell. Being omniscient, SCP-343 was already burdened with the awareness of what had happened. SCP-682 had been refined into an even worse version of itself by the clockworks. 
Up until now, God had been happy to avoid all the fighting and just see how everything worked out. But as much as he tried to distract himself, SCP-682 slaughtering other SCPs in droves was getting in the way of his reading. Oh, this again. In a split second, the entire universe had been unmade and then remade almost exactly the same. Except SCP-343 had made a slight adjustment, giving a little nudge to cause and effect in a few places. As a result, a certain misguided forum user had never and would never infiltrate the Foundation and break SCP-682 free, leading to the hard-to-destroy reptile being refined by the clockworks. Although, while it had been unceremoniously returned to its original form and placed back in its acid tank, SCP-682 could still remember the power it had wielded only moments before everything had been rewritten. All it needed was another chance to get into the clockworks. Ever since she was in high school, Faith had dreamed of moving out and finally getting a place of her own. It wasn't that she didn't love her parents. She did, but they were always around, always coming into her room without knocking, telling her when to go to bed, when to wake up, not to eat dinner in front of the TV. In college, she had some welcome independence, but she had to live with roommates. Again, they were perfectly nice people. Some of them she even considered good friends, but she hated having to share her space, having to come home from a long day of classes and see someone else's dishes piled up in the sink, to have someone else's music keeping her awake at night, to delay her morning shower because someone else had gotten there first. So she was thrilled when a few years after graduating, she got a new job at a marketing company that would finally let her afford a place by herself. At last, she could have some peace, some quiet, and most importantly, some privacy. Faith spent all day moving furniture and unpacking boxes, turning the little apartment into a real home. It wasn't much, just a main room she used as a bedroom and living room, a bathroom, and a basic little kitchen. But it was all hers, and all of the little personal touches she'd put together really made it feel like the place was meant for her. There was the orange couch she'd picked up at a vintage store downtown, the coffee table she'd gotten for free from her last roommate, framed pictures of her family and friends, a bed with linens in her favorite color, light blue, and lots and lots of potted plants. Over time, she would find even more things, more little personal touches to liven up the space, now, how to celebrate her new home? Her gas wasn't on yet, so she couldn't cook anything, but that was the perfect excuse to order in. 30 minutes or less later, she was kicking back on her couch with a large cheese pizza, watching a scary movie on her TV. No one would ask to switch it over to The Bachelor. No one would take the last slice while she was in the bathroom. It was perfect. Finally, a little piece of heaven, an introvert's paradise. As she finished her first meal in the new place, she felt her eyes beginning to grow heavy, the day of strenuous unpacking catching up with her body. Just as she was thinking about calling it a night, a pale-faced monster appeared out of nowhere on screen, terrifying the movie's main character and making Faith jump, spilling her soda all over the coffee table. Damn it! She groaned. Already she'd made a mess, but hey, she tried to look on the bright side. It was yet another first to break in the apartment. She grabbed a kitchen towel to mop up the soda, and when she returned to the main room, she froze. There was something in the window, standing out against the darkness outside. At first, she thought it was a reflection, a trick of the light, but as she slowly approached the window, eyes wide and hands trembling, she got a better look. There was a face, a little difficult to make out, as if it were peering out of the shadows, but unmistakable nonetheless. It was pale, human, vaguely resembling a strange man with dark circles under his eyes, and he was looking right at her. She didn't scream. She was too terrified to make a sound. She stared at the face for a long moment, waiting for it to do something, anything. After several moments of the tensest staring contest of her life, she blinked. The face didn't budge. Y you need to leave. She finally spoke, surprising herself as she did. If you don't get out of here, I'm calling the cops. Again, the face did nothing. Do you hear me? Her voice climbed in pitch, her heart pounding against the inside of her chest. Who was he? What did he want? She became vaguely aware of the fact that she couldn't see the rest of the man's body, just his face. Looking at her with a neutral expression, 
a look of vague curiosity, like someone watching a caged animal at the zoo might have. It was then she remembered something that made her blood run cold, made the towel drop from her hands as her stomach sank. She lived on the third floor. Her apartment had no balcony, no fire escape he could have climbed up. Whatever was looking at her through her window, it was no ordinary peeping Tom. She couldn't say how long she stared at the face, its unblinking eyes, its inscrutable expression. She moved closer to the window, step by step, until she was almost nose to nose with the thing. She couldn't think of it as a person, though it looked like one, mostly. She should run screaming out the door, looking for some kind of help, but what would she say? That there was a floating face looking at her through the window? What if it was somehow all in her head? Some sort of hallucination brought on by exhaustion and the stress of the move. She raised a fist and following a passive instinct, rapped on the glass. She didn't know what she expected, for it to blink, to move, to knock back, to say something, but nothing happened. It just stayed there, as if it were part of the window itself. Faith pulled the curtains closed, hiding the strange face from view. With any luck, it would be gone in the morning. She had worked hard to get this apartment, and she would be damned if she let some strange thing, whatever it was, drive her out of her new home. But as she climbed into bed and pulled the covers up to her chin, she could still feel its gaze on her, as if it could see through the thick fabric of the curtains. She rolled over onto her side, her back to the window, and tried her best to forget about it, to shake that horrible feeling of being observed. She lay there for hours, eyes open, heart racing. But finally, the exhaustion won, and she slipped away into sleep. She didn't dream at all that night. It was as if she closed her eyes and seconds later, it was morning. She woke to the beep of her alarm, feeling as if she hadn't rested at all. The first thing she did was climb out of the bed and go to the window. Carefully, tentatively, she opened the curtains. She let out a sigh of deep relief. The face was gone. She must have imagined it after all. A bit concerning, but as long as it didn't happen again, she wouldn't have anything to worry about. Lack of sleep does strange things to the mind after all. No longer plagued by the fear of that strange face, Faith hopped into the shower and let the worries of the previous night wash away, disappearing down the drain. She brushed her teeth, dried her hair, did her makeup, and dressed for work. After a banana and a quick cup of coffee, she was out the door. Work was exceptionally busy that day, and it pushed any memory of the oddity in the window out of her mind entirely. She was even feeling good enough to accept her friend's offer to grab a drink after work. They met up at a bar down the street from her new place, sharing cocktails, memories, and a plate of onion rings. It was a perfect, lovely evening. By the time she got home, savoring the click of the key in the lock as she let herself into her quiet little sanctuary, she had completely forgotten about the unusual apparition. She swung the door open and rushed to dump herself onto the couch for a bit of TV before bed. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw it. The face, back in its previous place, staring at her from the darkness outside. She gasped at the sight, her scream catching in her throat. It was just as she remembered it. Wait, no, something was different. What was it? She clapped her mouth in horror as she identified the change. Its expression was different. Gone was the vaguely interested, neutral expression. Now, it was smiling at her. Not a pleasant smile, not a warm, friendly smile. A wicked smile, twisted and cruel. It knew she was afraid, that she'd been hoping it was gone forever, and it was enjoying itself. Her hands were shaking, nervous sweat beating on her brow. What do you want from me? She whispered, staring into its eyes. They didn't move, but they glittered with malicious glee just the same. What do you want from me? She repeated, her voice rising to a shout. Shut up! Her next door neighbor yelled, banging on the wall. It's after midnight! She couldn't bring herself to respond. She had more important things to attend to. Her stomach turned, bile rising in her throat. Would the face be gone again in the morning? Would it come back again at night? Was the apartment haunted, possessed by a specter doomed to reside in her window forever? Was that why the rent had been so affordable? Or maybe it was her. Maybe this thing had been drawn to her. Or maybe she was losing her mind. Unaccustomed to living alone, and her sanity was slipping away. She shivered at the thought. What was worse, 
if the face was on her head or if it wasn't. Rather than attempt to answer the question gnawing at her, she closed the curtains. Out of sight, out of mind, she thought. She would have to keep the curtain closed, possibly forever. It was better than seeing that damned face grinning that horrible grin. But as she tried to settle in for another restless night, she could feel its eyes boring into her, burning into her skull. She had never felt so uneasy before. She prepared for cockroaches, for black mold, and for burglars, but not for this. This was something outside of her understanding, outside of reality itself. Just don't look, she whispered to herself. Just don't look at it. It became part of her daily routine. Wake up, ignore the window, go to work, try to forget about the window, get home, try desperately not to think about the window. She could always feel it, though. As soon as the sun went down, though, she kept the curtains closed. She knew it was there. She thought about checking to see what face it was making this time, but she couldn't bring herself to look. Gradually, her condition worsened. She woke up to a tightness in her chest, panic attacks that wrecked her body and felt like her heart might stop beating. Her stomach would ache. She struggled to keep food down. One morning, she rushed to the bathroom and spat up blood. The effect began to follow her out of the apartment, too, far away from the face's dwelling. She would sit at her desk, struggling to focus on marketing campaigns and pitches, and she would feel a sudden pain in her stomach, forcing her to double over and groan with agony. She would see flickers of the pale face in her peripheral vision turning to look, only to find there was nothing there. When she walked down the hall to the elevator or down the street outside her building, she would feel as if someone was following her. She never saw anyone never heard any footsteps coming up behind her, but she could never shake off the sensation. Soon, even her formerly dreamless nights of sleep, as fitful as they had been, became unsafe. She would toss and turn, sweating through her sheets, as her subconscious was tormented by chilling visions and terrible nightmares. She would dream of walking down a long, dark hallway that seemed to go on forever, and something coming up behind her, trying to grab her and drag her away. It would chase her, wide dark eyes and long, long limbs grasping at her as she ran and ran but never escaped. Other times she would dream of being locked in a damp basement, chained to a wall as the pale creature sat in a chair across from her, just watching, waiting for something, though she didn't know what. Every night, another nightmare that made her wake up screaming, fighting off invisible attackers. After two weeks of living in hell, she decided to look out the window again. She had to see, had to know. That night, when she opened the curtains, it was there. Mouth wide open, eyes glinting. It was laughing at her. Screw the deposit, enough was enough. She wanted her home back. She picked up the heavy lamp on her bedside table, wound it up, and threw it out the window with all her might. The glass shattered. Little crystalline shards sprang in every direction as the lamp flew through the air, out the window, and down to the street below. And just like that, the face was gone. She checked every other window in place, the little one in the bathroom, the peephole on her door, but it was nowhere to be found. She was free. Her knees gave out and she collapsed to the floor, her face in her hands and wept from sheer relief. Tomorrow she would clean up the broken glass and spin her landlord a story about a freak accident. Someone would come to fix the window, and it would be the best money she had ever spent. Eventually the whole ordeal would fade away from memory like a bad dream, but somewhere out there, Someone else was living the nightmare all over again, looking out a darkened window to see an unwelcome guest, the entity known as SCP-965. SCP-965 is a phenomenon affecting framed windows. When it appears, it manifests in the shape of a shadowy face, belonging to a pale man staring in through the window. The details of the man's face vary from person to person, as well as his apparent age and the direction he is facing. However, all reports point to the same figure at various ages, ranging from 10 to 55. The Foundation has attempted to use facial recognition software to identify a citizen matching the description of this figure, but so far, no one has been found. SCP-965 will not appear in just any window. It will only manifest when the lighting on the outside of the window drops below illumination of five candelas. The lighting on the inside of the window does not have any measurable effect. The face will only appear in the confines of a completely assembled window frame, though the window does not necessarily need to be installed anywhere. 
It will only move from one glass pane to another if its original point of manifestation is destroyed. The face can be seen from an outside vantage point, though it has been described by observers as looking away into the room. When SCP-965 first appears to someone, it produces feelings of unease, anxiety, and low-grade paranoia. Anyone within the visual range of the affected window will experience these feelings, even if the window is covered by curtains or any other means. Any individual that sleeps in an area visible to SCP-965's manifestation point will begin to experience difficulty sleeping, suffering from upsetting and disturbing dreams. However, this is not the endpoint of the entity's impact on those it appears to. At a point between three and ten nights of sleep, after its initial appearance, the entity's facial expression will begin to shift into a noticeable smile. After this shift, the victim's symptoms will become physical as well as mental, including ulcers and intestinal bleeding, heartburn, abdominal pain, and even vomiting blood. This has been attributed to the entity's influence on the human body's reaction to heightened levels of stress and fear. The subjects that reach this stage of exposure to SCP-965 begin to see its face in windows in their dreams, as well as spotting it in their peripheral vision while going about their waking life. They begin to see the face out of the corner of their eye, even when the affected window is nowhere in sight. These additional sightings are accompanied by lingering feelings of paranoia and the sensation that something is following or watching them. Though the entity has never made a sound and does not move while it is visible, it can disappear and reappear in different poses. It has also displayed notable signs of sentience, appearing disappointed when it manifests in an empty room, and angry if it sees someone who broke its previous window. When presented with one of the agents who first brought it into custody, the entity appeared frightened for the first time. Testing involving SCP-965, involving the destruction of its host window, confirmed that a multi-paned window might act as multiple holding zones, but significant damage to its overall structure keeps it from being a viable replacement. In this particular case, the entity manifested in a nearby experimentation chamber's observation window, which was promptly destroyed in order to prevent any potential breaches. For a month following this incident, the entity manifested with noticeably hostile facial expressions, clearly resentful of its treatment. Only one other notable incident has occurred so far during the course of SCP-965's containment by the SCP Foundation. Dr. L, the rest of her name has been redacted from the official file, was the head researcher assigned to SCP-965 for several months before she filed an official request for transfer to a different test subject. She was beginning to experience intrusive visions of SCP-965 and lingering feelings of paranoia, lasting long after she left the Foundation's site. Her symptoms were consistent with those of someone who had slept in the presence of the entity, though she swore up and down she had never napped or slept at all in the vicinity of the affected window. She was temporarily relieved of her duties and provided with psychological care. So far, no other instances of SCP-965 impacting staff who have not slept in its presence have been reported, but this case set an unsettling precedent. The mental health of anyone assigned to SCP-965 is to be strictly monitored in case it expands its influence again. SCP-965 is contained within a framed, ready-to-install window made up of six panes of clear glass or other comparable material at a size of at least 15 centimeters by 30 centimeters. The window must be kept in an environmentally controlled storage facility, capable of withstanding earthquakes and other seismic activity. The window must be inspected at least once a week in order to check the integrity of the material. Additionally, at least two identical framed windows must be stored in the same facility, in separate chambers with additional insulation. Any lighting in the containment chamber should be kept at a minimum of 130 candelas at any time personnel are inside, with the exception of research and experimentation. Though SCP-965 is currently contained, the Foundation is unable to control its movement should its current window be destroyed. Therefore, SCP-965 is classified as Euclid. Scopophobia is the fear of being watched or looked at by others. Those suffering from this fear will often avoid windows, terrified of who might be standing on the other side, staring in and keeping track of everything they do. Even those of us without scopophobia might find ourselves feeling a prickle of dread while looking out the window at night watching for a shadowy figure or a ghastly face pressed to the glass. Most of the time, of course, there is no one there, 
It's just an overactive imagination, the lingering effect of watching one too many scary movies. But eventually, your luck might just run out. One night, when the world falls quiet and you go to close the curtains before you go to sleep, just in case, you might just feel that someone is right there, on the other side of that thin pane of glass, staring at you with wide, unblinking eyes. It won't ever come inside, but it isn't going anywhere. And as long as you are where it can see you, you will never know peace again. True Horror, The Airplane Door, Belching Smoke, and a Burning Red Light, The Dead Talking in Ancient Guttural Latin, a monstrous angel made of rings, wings, and eyes whipping barbed tentacles at screaming, terrified priests. You can scarcely imagine a more hellish place. Bishop Franklin's knees gave out under him as soon as the man set foot back on solid ground. Nearing his 70th birthday, he'd never been a particularly tough man, but after the day he'd had, he doubted he'd ever be the same again. Almost being ripped into another dimension, almost being at the center of a nuclear explosion, seeing. He threw up on the ground as the Foundation personnel rushed over to him. Never, never again. Just eight hours earlier, Bishop Franklin had been getting on with his Friday preparations. They had mass coming up this weekend, so he was doing the rounds of the cathedral, putting out new candles and straightening pews. He was nearly done, ready to get on with the rest of his morning, when he saw two suited figures entering the cathedral. He shuffled over to them, trying to explain that they were closed, but quickly faltered when he saw the grave look on their faces. Just ten minutes later, he was in the back of their car, still holding a spare candle, with agents from the SCP Foundation sitting on either side of him. They handed him file after file each most redacted, explaining the basis of who they were and where they were headed. It was a lot for the old priest to wrap his head around. He'd always believed in a higher power and a spiritual realm, but this sounded a whole lot more serious than that. Monsters, aliens, other dimensions, facilities, portals. He questioned the agents on it. They just looked grimly from one to another as the car wound its way to the private airstrip in the middle of nowhere. Bishop Franklin had always hated flying, but he hated it a whole lot more as he approached the airplane with no idea where he'd be landing. A small group of men were gathered on the runway, just by the foot of a Boeing aircraft. It seemed like a pretty substantial plane for such a small group of them. He was at least a little heartened to see that none of them had brought luggage either. In fact, most of them were just like him. As Bishop Franklin approached the group, he recognized various faces other bishops, archbishops, and senior priests. With him there, they totaled seven. The others all looked at him, not saying much. Bishop Franklin tried his best to start asking questions, but two things happened in quick succession that closed his mouth very quickly. Firstly, the luggage hold of the plane was opened, and two enormous shapes were loaded into it via forklift. Each shape had unmistakable symbols on the sheets covering them. Nuclear danger. Reeling from this revelation, Bishop Franklin turned to the group to be face to face with the Pope himself. He immediately shut his mouth. You may also be wondering what on earth was going on at this airfield. The truth is, Bishop Franklin, along with six other priests of Abrahamic faiths, were about to embark on the monthly flight of SCP-616. Within this plane, as all these men were soon about to find out, exists an emergency door. Covered with satanic iconography, this door, when opened at ground level, operates just like any other emergency door, leading to the outside of the plane. Although any individuals who had passed through this door in this normal state reported feeling heightened anxiety during and after. However, once a month, this door will be anything but normal, opening a gate to, well, you'll soon see. In order to mitigate the threat posed to humanity through SCP-616-1, or the gate, the plane must be in the air at the time of its opening, far above and away from any human settlements. In order to keep this event contained, the door must be kept open for the duration of the portal's existence until it has closed of its own accord. But holding this door open is not a simple test of strength, it is a test of belief. In order to protect all of humanity from unknown horrors of a cataclysmic scale, 
Seven priests of Abrahamic faiths must be on board for this monthly flight, praying for the door to remain open. The ability to keep the door open, it turns out, is unrelated to physical prowess, but instead is based entirely on one's own belief that the door can be held open. As such, religious figures praying to a higher power are incredibly well suited to the task. Once per year, the flight is blessed by the Pope, and every time the plane takes off, it must be holding two nuclear warheads in its hull. Both can be remotely detonated by the ground team, who will be in constant radio communication with the pilot. Should the pilot fail to give them regular updates on the status of SCP-616-1, the event will be treated as an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, and both nuclear devices will be detonated without hesitation. But Bishop Franklin only knew about half of this information from his redacted set of documents and had forgotten half of them on his stressful car journey. As he strapped himself into a window seat, he was trembling like a leaf. He desperately wanted to complain about being put into this situation, but he wasn't entirely sure who he would complain to. If he spoke to anyone external about what he was about to witness, he had been told by the Foundation agents that he would be administered with a Class C amnestic, whatever that meant. He really didn't want to find out. Fortunately for him, the most familiar of the faces from the group of priests sat next to him in the aisle seat. Bishop… Uh, what was his name? Sensing Bishop Franklin's uncertainty, the man reached a hand over and warmly reintroduced himself. Bishop Pete. They'd met two years ago in Berlin. Just that small action was almost enough to settle Bishop Franklin's nerves as the plane started to barrel down the runway. Almost. The plane took off, causing the old man's stomach to drop. Heart hammering, he looked around, spotting the emergency door. It was just up ahead of him, around the middle of the fuselage. It would have looked like a normal emergency exit, but for the blood-red markings scrawled across it. A wave of dread washed over him. It certainly looked evil, that was for sure. Trying his best to help, Bishop Pete struck up a conversation. He explained it wasn't his first time doing this. He'd been drafted to help three months ago. It was scary for sure, but everything was totally fine. The Foundation had planned everything to a T. It would have helped Bishop Franklin's nerves, but it only made his mind jump to the nuclear weapons he'd seen loaded into where his suitcase would have normally gone. The two of them lapsed into silence for a while. No one on the plane was really speaking. He supposed he should have used this opportunity to pray, but according to his briefing, he'd be doing a lot of that very soon. He hadn't entirely understood what the Foundation had meant by that. He'd been told to pray to, quote, keep the door open. What had they meant by that? A bang shattered the silence as the emergency door slammed wide open. In an instant, the plane went into a nosedive as all the air rushed from inside. The lights went out for several seconds, then came back on in flashing panicked spasms. Bishop Franklin clung for dear life onto the back of the chair in front of him. As the roar of air rushed around him, it had gone dark outside with shapeless clouds swirling around him, shaking the plane. Screaming voices filled the aircraft, not just the voices of the men on board, but women and children too, crying out in agony and terror through throats that sounded like they'd been lashed with razor wire. Then he saw it. SCP-616-1. The gate was wide open. Smoke billowed out of it crawling along the floors of the cabin like an octopus creeping its way along the ocean floor. Red light seemed to spill out of it, but when he tried to look through the gate itself, it was like his brain wasn't working anymore. There were colors there, but there were ones he didn't recognize. Maybe they weren't colors at all. It was like his brain fixated on trying to sort them into something that made sense, something rational. A hand grasped his arm, and he turned to see Bishop Pete staring at him with wild eyes. The plane was going down, they could both feel it, and that emergency door was slowly creeping shut. They had been brought onto this plane for one job only, to pray like their lives depended on it. Bishop Franklin screwed his eyes shut and clasped his hands together. He hadn't prayed like that since he was a little kid, but he figured now was the time to use all the tricks in the book. He begged and pleaded in a tiny voice for God to keep that door open. It felt so counterintuitive, so backwards, to want to keep that kind of door open as the air roared and screamed around him, but a small voice inside of him told him to persevere, have a little faith. 
But suddenly, the bishop noticed that the man sitting alongside him had fallen silent. Feeling like a naughty child at mass, he opened one eye and peered sideways. Bishop Pete was still in his seat, but he'd slumped over. He wasn't breathing. His skin was cold to the touch, deathly cold. Then all of a sudden, his head rocketed backwards and he started talking. Not talking like a normal man, but talking like a man possessed. His dead eyes rolled around in his head aimlessly as guttural voices rasped out of his throat. None of them were the words that Bishop Franklin recognized. They sounded almost like Latin, but far darker and more ancient. And the more the dead man spoke, the more the emergency door closed. The bishop started praying again, much harder this time, digging his fingernails into his palms so hard that he felt them drawing blood. He needed to keep this door open. He had to, and he could. He believed it entirely in that moment. The door banged back open, wider than ever, despite the chanting of the dead body in the seat next to him. Nightmares swelled to the forefront of his mind as the plane hurtled to the ground. Only, the plane wasn't hurtling to the ground. In fact, it was flying at a perfectly steady altitude of 10,972 meters, with an airspeed of about 780 kilometers an hour. In fact, aside from the death of Bishop Pete, everything within the plane was going perfectly to plan. Deaths of priests were just an occupational hazard of keeping this SCP contained. The pilot at the front of the plane regarded the whole situation playing out behind him while feeding constant information back to base. Everything was going perfectly according to plan, until the angel appeared. Bishop Franklin wasn't the first one to see it. That was the unfortunate lot of Archbishop Michael, who was sitting closest to the emergency door. He first spied it while staring through into the void, but his screams of terror warning those around him were drowned out by all the other commotion. It was only when the angel's wings crept their way through the edges of the door and the creature let itself into the cabin that the others saw it. But by this point, it was too late for Archbishop Michael. The angel was not like the angels we see in pop culture. A tall blonde person with white robes, fluffy wings, and a gentle face. It was a shifting mass of eyes and tortured wings, partially crawling along the ground, partially floating under the weight of its massive frame. It had to squeeze itself through the door to fit into the plane, but as it did, it lashed out at the Archbishop with a sinewy tendril and got to work violently killing him. That was when Bishop Franklin saw it and began to panic. He wanted nothing more than to stop praying, to let the emergency door slam shut and keep this creature away from them, but that little voice inside his head told him that wouldn't work. If that door was allowed to close before the gate had, then it would cause the apocalypse. He could not have that blood on his hands. So he prayed, sweat pouring down his face as the angel forced its way through the gate and into the cabin. He prayed as it slumped across the aisles, working its way along the line of men, slaughtering them one by one. He prayed as it saw him and rose to its full height, unfurling great wings and readying itself for the kill. And he prayed as a wind more powerful than any on earth blew through the cabin and pulled the angel back through the gate. The emergency door slammed shut, and in an instant, the plane seemed to right itself. No more turbulence, no more wind. The light flickered once more and then came back on steadily. The seatbelt sign pinged off, and oxygen masks dropped from the ceiling about four hours too late. Bishop Franklin couldn't believe the time when he looked at his wristwatch. He had been on this plane for weeks, surely, not just four hours. That was absurd. It all felt like a dream as the aircraft circled around the airstrip, preparing for landing. Everything in the plane seemed totally normal to him now. Except, of course, for the four dead bodies, one of which was slumped towards him in the aisle seat. The plane landed. The bishop staggered down the stairs and threw up on the blacktop. After a few awkward moments, the pilot sidled over to him and muttered a quick thanks. I was really close to calling it a failure there and having to set off them nukes. I don't know what you prayed for, but you did good today. Bishop Franklin didn't feel like he did good. He felt like he'd had his whole life, his whole worldview, turned upside down in the space of an interstate flight. He had been moments away from either being vaporized by a nuclear bomb or from having economy seats to the premiere of the destruction of the world as we knew it. But just 31 days later, Bishop Franklin was on that same flight again, praying his hardest as the aircraft dropped into freefall. 
If there was one thing that the Foundation noticed about working with religious leaders, it was that they had a real determination to keep coming back to help keep the world safe. What the Foundation didn't have the heart to tell them was that all of the satanic markings on the door were actually fake. They had been added by researchers in an attempt to make SCP-616-1 carry more significance for those in the aircraft. Later testing revealed that it was not exclusive to Abrahamic faiths, or any faith groups for that matter, that they could keep the gate open. Anyone who believed they could do it was capable of it. Faith leaders, however, are still being utilized, and the blessing is still being performed by the Pope on a yearly basis. It had been found that these external rituals, while not necessarily directly impactful, have strengthened the belief and resolve of those inside the plane, yielding fewer casualties and shorter durations. Various experiments have been conducted to see beyond the event horizon of the gate, to see what's on the other side. Those in the plane have reported as having the name Paradise, despite never going inside. A remote-controlled rover was sent inside the gate on one experiment, but the footage was deemed far too dangerous as all those who witnessed it died within two months. Hopefully, you didn't peer too closely into the gate as you watched this video. Those who have studied the various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation know that this world has quite a lot to fear. Enormous world-devouring monsters that thrive on an endless stream of hate. Seemingly innocuous statues waiting to snap your neck the second you turn your back, and a shark-eyed old man with the power to reach through solid concrete, grab hold of you with his rotting hands, and drag you into his own personal hell. SCP-106 can pop into our world whenever he wants, but like many of the most efficient predators, he has his own designated lair a pocket dimension where he can pull his prey and trap them in a horrifying game of cat and mouse that only ever ends one way, in a painful, prolonged end. We all know what SCP-106 uses his pocket dimension for, but what if some of the other anomalies at the Foundation had a pocket dimension of their very own? A tiny parallel reality that they could shape in their image and use it for whatever they wanted. What might that look like? A special team of SCP Foundation operatives were tasked with conducting an experiment using an elaborate computer system to run simulations and see what different anomalies might do with their pocket dimensions, should the opportunity ever arise. Stranger things have certainly happened at the SCP Foundation, so they prepared a list of anomalies that presented the most potential for interesting findings and fired up the simulation. For the very first subject, they selected an anomaly who was also a colleague, Dr. Bright and SCP-963. The monitor attached to the computer running the simulation showed a curious, surprising picture. There was a door with one sign, Bright Council Meeting Inside. Past the door was a long conference table packed to the brim with different attendees. There were guards, D-class, scientists, men and women, all wearing the trademark anomalous amulet. It was every single incarnation of the Doctor himself, all talking over each other with great enthusiasm. At the head of the table there was a monitor, depicting the current incarnation of Dr. Bright going about his daily life on a live video feed. All of the many, many Dr. Brights were instructing him, giving him advice and guidance on every impulse and decision. Some Dr. Brights were brandishing pies, others chainsaws, and others were drawing schematics for laser guns and catapults. The Council of Brights was working together, devising pranks, schemes, and general tomfoolery. The research team all agreed that Dr. Bright could never learn about this simulation result, lest he try to recreate it himself. Next, they inputted details about SCP-5094, Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse, the anomalous computer program capable of teaching anyone about any subject. With a triumphant beep, the computer announced that it had rendered a simulation of what Miss J's pocket dimension might be. It was a classroom, decorated in bright colors and cutouts of various numbers and letters. On the wall, motivational portraits were displayed, including kittens grabbing onto the rungs of a ladder with the slogan, Hang In There. There were bookshelves all along the walls, filled to the brim with books. At the chalkboard, a three-dimensional version of Miss J herself was standing with her signature ponytail and bright green vest, a piece of chalk in her hand. The desks were all empty, but she had a chipper smile on her face and was waiting for students to come in and learn at any minute. On the board, she had written, Welcome Class. 
Next, they chose an entity whose inner life was a bit more difficult to discern, whose motivations, though seemingly straightforward, were perplexing. SCP-049 The Plague Doctor, forever in pursuit of curing a pestilence that he could not get the Foundation to understand, creating lifeless zombies whenever he attempted to treat a patient. Where would this inscrutable doctor disappear to, if he only could? What would his hideaway be? The simulation rendered a sterile laboratory environment, no real surprise given his proclivity for medical science. There were stainless steel tables and instruments. The plague doctor stood in the fully outfitted lab, going about his work as he always did, with no one to interrupt or disturb him. On the desk in the corner sat a pile of medical texts, a vase filled with lavender flowers in fresh water, and a generous glass of rich red wine. There was everything here that he could possibly need. What about a pocket dimension for an entity that already had everything it could possibly want? Something so content, so happy with its everyday life, that it had no need or desire to escape. SCP-999 lived as a pampered pet, a sort of foundation mascot, with its every wish for tasty treats or playtime met. Still, they inputted the Tickle Monster's information into the simulation to see what it might come up with. What it rendered looked like something out of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It was a wide open field beneath a bright blue sky, filled with sunlight and fluffy white clouds. The landscape, however, was not the greenery and nature one might expect to see, but instead was made up entirely of candy and other sweets. Boulders made of toffee, a lake of melted chocolate, lollipop trees, and cotton candy bushes as far as the eye could see. Nestled within the candy landscape was an elaborate playground, more of an amusement park than the usual row of swings and a plastic slide. There was a miniature ferris wheel, a ball pit, and an obstacle course that SCP-999 could bounce around and navigate. Every simple, childlike joy was present in this place. Pure sweetness, happiness, and light. For a creature as good as SCP-999, they would expect nothing less. Next up was the deadly statue that moved only when out of sight, SCP-173. It took the researchers a moment to understand what they were seeing when they took a look at its dimension. At first, they thought that perhaps the simulation had somehow crashed. After all, they were looking at a pitch-black screen. Then, they realized. They were seeing what its dimension would look like after all. The perfect place for SCP-173 to retreat to would be somewhere cloaked in absolute darkness, where no one could keep an eye on the statue and stop it from moving as it pleased. Here, it would be free to hunt and take lives as much as it wanted, keeping unsuspecting humans in suspense as they waited for the sound of grinding stone to betray that the end was near. The researchers all shuddered and glanced over their shoulders just in case. Since they were already feeling unsettled, they decided to take it one step further and see what SCP-682 might create for itself. What could be home for the creature that hates everything? They were horrified to see a bleak, stony landscape where the massive reptile was devouring everything in sight. Humans, plants, animals, none were safe from being snapped up in its deadly jaws. That wasn't the worst of it, though. When it had finished consuming everything, SCP-682 opened its mouth and coughed all of its victims back up, miraculously resurrected and unharmed. Then it began to do it all over again, ripping, tearing, and clawing at all the living things around it in an endless cycle of despair. One researcher began to feel sick and had to flee the room. The rest pressed on, if a bit paler than they had been moments before. Since the vibes in the room were already as bad as they could possibly get, one researcher suggested they keep the momentum going and try out another highly hostile anomaly, the possessive mask itself, SCP-035. What sort of cursed reality could the simulation come up with for the malicious mask, a being that, though it could not move on its own, seemed to radiate an almost unstoppable evil? The monitor showed a rendering of an ornately decorated castle with a medieval European sensibility, gold decor and rich red velvet curtains, dots of black and red like blood and black goo on everything. On the walls, elaborate tapestries were hung depicting the traditional comedy and tragedy masks that SCP-035 resembled. There was a stained glass window toward the back of the room, 
depicting SCP-035 with a full human body sitting atop a golden throne, a crown on its head. In the very center of the room, there was SCP-035 in a position matching the stained glass window. At its feet, dozens of people dressed in rags were kneeling in supplication to their ruler. The mask was smiling. Of course that awful thing would want to make itself the king of its own private castle, forcing others to serve its every whim. Time to shift gears to something completely different. SCP-2662, also known as Cthulhu. Despite the creature's intimidating appearance, he was overall a relatively polite being. What would his chosen sanctuary look like? SCP-2662's simulated pocket dimension was a far cry from the luxury of SCP-035's. There were no riches here, no opulent displays of wealth and power. It was the opposite. The room depicted resembled a standard studio apartment, with a bed, a couch, a television, and a kitchenette. Every up-to-date game console, and some that didn't exist yet, could be seen throughout the room, and posters for various video games and action and sci-fi movies adorned the walls. There were stacks and stacks of games ready to be played, as well as an extra-large beanbag chair positioned directly in front of the TV screen. There, SCP-2662 sat, gaming happily. The room had no windows, and no visible door, either. No way for strangers to intrude on his peaceful, private leisure time. Up next on the list was SCP-953, the polymorphic humanoid. But when the simulation rendered her pocket dimension, she was nowhere to be seen. There was a beautiful landscape, like something out of a painting, of what appeared to be an idyllic location in rural Korea. There was vibrant green grass, a light blue sky dotted with delicate wisps of clouds, and a clear trickling stream. There was a man lying by the stream, basking in the sunlight, though he didn't look like any anomaly the research team recognized. They were checking him for the telltale fox ears or tail that indicated a shapeshifted SCP-953, when suddenly, a figure emerged from the water. A woman with long, dark hair, wearing a white dress, and with those oh-so-familiar ears poking out from her scalp. She stretched her sharp claws wide and snapped her fingers. Suddenly, the landscape changed. The sky went dark, the clouds replaced with fox eyes glaring down from the heavens, the stream flowed red with blood, and the grass became a carpet of gnarled orange fur. The man scrambled to his feet in a desperate bid for escape, but SCP-953 jumped on him before he could so much take a step away from her and began to torture him gleefully. The screen went red, as if with blood. The researchers definitely needed a palate cleanser after that nightmarish vision, so they selected a much more wholesome entity from the list for the next round. SCP-2295, the patchwork bear that so deeply wanted to heal the world and help the sick and hurting. Its simulated dimension resembled an ordinary doctor's office waiting room, with chairs, a check-in desk, and some toys and books for bored patients of all ages. There was one difference, however. Everything in the room was made from scrap fabric and yarn, materials the bear could use to patch a potentially infinite number of troubles. This was a place where the bear could bring anyone in need of its help and treat them to the best of its ability. But what about an anomaly that was not sentient, or at the very least one whose sentience was very much up for debate? The team selected SCP-914 for the next simulation. Inputting the details of 914, or the clockworks, resulted in an image of a small factory with large metal doors. Inside, all manner of unidentifiable machinery worked in tandem to rearrange and reconfigure various items. There were different conveyor belts, each marked according to one of the clockwork settings. Coarse, rough, one-to-one, -one, fine, and very fine. Perhaps one researcher posited this pocket dimension was not theoretical at all. Maybe this was where items went when they disappeared into the machine's intake booth. Then again, who could be certain how exactly an item like SCP-914 really worked? Next was SCP-073, or Kane. In his dimension, the world of his own making, he strolled through a dense forest, the vegetation thriving all around him where it would have ordinarily withered and died. He plucked an apple off a tree and took a bite. SCP-529, Josie the Half-Cat, romped through a playroom that could only be described as Cat Heaven.
scratching posts, fish and chicken treats, balls of yarn, everything a feline friend could ever desire. One researcher wiped a tear from her eye, and when her colleagues questioned it, she just replied, I really like cats, okay? In a subject change, another researcher suggested trying a sort of before and after experiment with the simulation. They would see what sort of pocket dimension might be generated by an anomaly before a traumatic event and what it might create after. They settled on SCP-066, Eric's toy. First, they built the simulation around SCP-066 as it first behaved when it arrived at the SCP Foundation. The result produced was a world made of colorful yarn, filled with living yarn creatures roaming around the landscape as Eric's toy rolled among them cheerfully. Then they inputted the details of the incident that shifted the entity's behavior, when a D-Class attempted to cut off a piece of its yarn body for study. The resulting pocket dimension was made not of yarn, but of fleshy tendrils dripping with red that curled and writhed like tentacles, grasping and squeezing aggressively at anything that intruded on the space. A striking visual representation of the change in the anomaly's mental and emotional state. Next was SCP-1867, Lord Blackwood. Lord Blackwood's pocket out of reality was the interior of a grand hunting lodge, with a roaring fire in the fireplace and an impressive, if a bit macabre, bearskin rug stretched across the floor. Lord Blackwood stood in all of his brightly colored sea slug glory at a bar in the corner of the room, next to a glass of whiskey and a hand-carved wooden pipe. All along the wall were various trophies, taxidermy of a variety of wild beasts that the slug had hunted over the years, as well as artifacts picked up along its travels. Fossils, rare books, paintings, and primitive weapons. There were also grainy old photographs of Lord Blackwood with many of his associates from over the years, other famed hunters and gentlemen explorers he had embarked on his expeditions alongside. SCP-4910, the Grinner, would dwell in a volcanic landscape, where rock and lava were replaced with fleshy pink gums and teeth jutted out of every available surface. Gnarly. SCP-076, Abel, would use his pocket dimension as a battle arena, a grand coliseum of sorts filled with every weapon imaginable, where he could trap his strongest would-be opponents and force them into a fight to the death. SCP-527, Mr. Fish's simulated pocket world resembled the city of Boston, with one notable difference. Every depiction of a human being, from statues to billboard advertisements to magazine covers, showed them with fish heads atop their human bodies. There was not a human head to be seen, except at what would have ordinarily been the seafood market. There you could find chests of ice-held fresh human heads that were ready to be sold. Though the sight of the human heads was a bit disconcerting, the research team understood the significance of this place. It made sense that Mr. Fish would want to retreat to a world that matched his lived experience, where everyone else looked like him. There was even a hat shop stocked with tiny little formal hats like his very own top hat. If SCP-2800 Cactus Man had a place between realities that belonged exclusively to him, it would be an underground superhero hideout. The room depicted on the monitor resembled the Batcave, but with all of the bat-themed decor replaced with cactus-themed items instead. There were also several large Seguro cacti planted in pots throughout the space, as well as several Cactus Man costumes in glass cases ready to be worn. SCP-294 The Coffee Machine would have a secret world filled with every liquid substance known to man, and several still undiscovered, floating through the air but somehow never mixing together. Any beverage anyone could ever ask for would be there, just waiting for the right order to come in. SCP-352 Baba Yaga was next. It was a large forest, seemingly ordinary at first glance, but within its depths lurked every fear a person could ever have, depending on what unsuspecting victim she was able to pull into the darkness. There could be a high up cliffside waiting for someone afraid of heights, a giant spider awaiting an arachnophobe, or thick, inky blackness waiting for someone afraid of the dark. All around the forest floor, her hair curled, waiting to ensnare her prey. SCP-662, more specifically SCP-662-1, Mr. Deeds, quite possibly already occupied a pocket dimension when his bell was not in use. Though they had no way to know for certain, the simulation predicted that his break room of sorts might look like this. 
a blue room with two shelves filled with cleaning tools, a brown couch, and a little bed in the corner where the butler could sleep during his time off. SCP-169 Leviathan would disappear into an aquatic pocket dimension, a place large enough for it to swim comfortably, possibly forever, in the peaceful, infinite ocean. Then the research staff decided to input SCP-096 and see what the Shy Guy's pocket dimension might look like. Unlike the old man, this anomaly was not aggressive all the time, and it seemed to take no pleasure in hunting. Instead, it acted in a kind of twisted self-defense, attacking anything that saw its face and set it off on a spree of violence that ended in death. SCP-096's potential pocket dimension was a dark, dismal labyrinth, like something out of the Greek myth of the Minotaur. Stone corridors twisted this way and that, leading any potential intruders down dead ends and away from the center, where SCP-096 hid from sight. In the center, there was light and life, trees, grass, a small pond, and a nest filled with blind birds chirping and singing to SCP-096 as it sat in complete obscurity, away from prying eyes. The man's bedroom hadn't been silent for over 100 years now. The carpet had been worn down, a thick layer of dust had gathered on every surface, and the same trapped air had stagnated for so long that it had become unbearable for anyone entering the room. But no one was allowed to enter the room. Nobody could open that door ever again, or it could mark the beginning of not just an apocalypse, but a breakdown in the nature of reality itself. Figures shuffled around the room, sometimes dozens, sometimes as few as three, all rotting, but never dying. Researchers peered through the window in abject terror day after day, as the laws of physics broke down before their very eyes. All of them except one, a lone scientist with a plan to get inside that room. A plan that the Foundation would shoot him dead for. A plan that he was seconds away from enacting as the improvised explosive device in his satchel clunked heavily against his thigh. In many ways, we are just as trapped as SCP-001, if not more so. We are trapped in our own three-dimensional world. Take a stick figure drawn on a piece of paper. That stick figure knows up and down, left and right, and that is their world. You draw a box around them, and they are trapped, unable to simply step forward out of the page and walk around it. For us, looking down at the stick figure, we might laugh at their foolishness. Trapped inside a child's drawing of a house, it begs the question, is there a creature looking down at us and laughing? We may be able to move up and down, left and right, forward and backward, outsmarting the simple stick figure. But in time, we are just as caged in, living our entire lives on this razor-thin piece of paper called the present. The future is always just out of reach, the past always repelling us. We have no choice but to exist in the now, slowly creeping through history without any agency of our own. Curse to be born, live, and die in that order. You can never be a child again, never see your mother's face for the first time beaming down at you. You cannot skip ahead to your dying minutes, knowing what it is you will have to face up to in your life. Maybe the idea of facing up to things at all will fade with the freedom of exploring what once was and what will be as if it were no more difficult than taking a step out of a 2D box. The bell rang, cutting Professor Davies off. He hadn't meant to go into such an existential tangent, especially for his first-year students. Most of them looked like they were in a daze, not really listening to anything he had been saying. Quantum mechanics sure was a complex topic to cover in just one semester at university. He'd spent his entire career trying to wrap his head around it, and still spend most of his days with the same bored and confused glaze over his eyes as the teenagers who made their way to the back of the hall. But one figure, standing just beyond the doorway peering down at him, caught the professor's eye. Little did he know how drastically his career was about to change in just a few minutes. A preeminent physicist at just 28 years old, Professor Davies had already achieved the status that many academics will not see within their lifetimes. 
Whenever anyone asked him about it, he always made the joke that he was cheating. He didn't believe in the concept of a linear lifetime in the first place. Still too young to be taken seriously by many of his peers, he had flown under the academic radar for much of his career so far. Perhaps it was as simple as that. Or perhaps certain undercover agents had a hand in suppressing news of his blossoming career in quantum research. His hands trembled as he approached the reinforced glass. He gripped the bag tightly, trying his best not to let his fear show. If any of them saw what he was about to do, if they even suspected something, he would have a dozen bullets flying through the back of his skull before he'd even have a chance to put his hands up. Shifting his weight from foot to foot, he waited for the airlock to be opened for him. A siren blared, red lights flashed, and the first glass door slid open. Stepping inside, he waited for the atmosphere in the chamber to adjust. Both doors were closed in front of and behind him. If they wanted to kill him, now would be the time. He closed his eyes and waited with bated breath, the bomb weighing heavily on his shoulder. But they would not kill him. He knew that now. What he was about to do was inevitable. It took several months for Professor Davies to be granted the full security clearance he needed. They kept referring to his project as a K-class anomaly, whatever that meant, in order to get him up to speed with the nature of what he was going to be working on. The Foundation assigned him to various other SCPs first. SCP-5027, 2821, 1887, any instance that had some link to quantum mechanics or complex theoretical physics. They wouldn't even tell him which SCP he was being trained up to work on until one morning when a team of agents was waiting for him at the door to his quarters. He wasn't allowed to bring a bag or any personal possessions, standard issue clothing, a toothbrush, and everything else he needed would all be provided for him. It was only then that they told him which SCP he was being assigned to. SCP-001 He was blindfolded for the entirety of the journey. Car, then plane, then another car. It was a full ten hours before his blindfold was removed and his new project was revealed to him. Professor Davies found himself in Site-01, the place where all of this started. All the SCPs, all the research, the secrecy, the assassinations, the deaths of countless innocent people, and an equal number of guilty parties, it all started right here, Site-01. The site itself resembled a large sarcophagus, similar to the one found covering the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Where do you think the Soviets got the blueprints from? Everything in the room is arranged in a circle around the center. Research desks, maintenance equipment, raw materials including a stockpile of wooden planks and reinforced metal sheets, monitoring equipment, security cameras, and of course, some of the most advanced automatic weapon systems in the world, all pointed at a great glass box in the middle of the hangar. Measuring 30 meters in each direction, the glass was 50 centimeters thick. Even all those high-caliber weapons would have had a hard time creating a chip in that. But it wasn't the glass box itself that was so interesting. It was what was trapped inside of it. A house inside a perfectly round glass bowl, with no entrances or exits. Complete with a front lawn, sidewalk, porch, and even a tree in the backyard. A regular American house, trapped in a box like some kind of science experiment. There was some kind of transparent airlock system at the entrance. On the other side was just a normal walk up the garden path to the edge of the second glass bubble enclosing the house. But on closer inspection, Professor Davies realized that this wasn't your typical American house at all. The street lamp wasn't electric. It was made of iron with little glass-paned windows. An oil lamp. In fact, the house did look odd to him. There was no electric doorbell, but instead an actual physical bell system. The whole house looked out of place, not just because it was in a box in the central hangar of a 42,000 ton sarcophagus, but because it was from another era entirely. You see, Site-01 was constructed around this house. The glass box and bubble, the sarcophagus, all of it was built around the already existing building. Beneath the foundations, a hundred meters beneath the surface, is an immense metal plate that forms a perfect seal with the defenses up top. The only way in and out of Site-01 is through an immense reinforced door. But even all those defenses will prove utterly futile if anyone ever opens the thin wooden door to the bedroom on the top floor of the house. That is the home and the prison in which SCP-001 is trapped. 
It is the job of the Foundation to make sure that it remains trapped there indefinitely. What is SCP-001? As Professor Davies made his way through the airlock for the very first time and entered the site under the supervision of four of the highest-ranking SCP staff alive today, he laid eyes on the entity itself for the first time. Standing on a scissor lift parked outside the front of the house, just inches away from the glass bubble, he was lifted high enough to look through the window into what looked like a young boy's bedroom on the top floor. Layers of dust coated the surfaces, black and white photos sat in frames, antique children's toys sat all around the walls, but Davies didn't notice any of them. He was too busy watching the men walking in all directions. Unhurried, but with purpose, well over a dozen men walked in all directions across the carpeted floor. They were all identical, around six feet, with heavy rotting skin that seemed to hang off their limbs like it would a carcass left in the sun. Human cadavers milling about in a young boy's bedroom. Davies was so taken aback by their appearance and behavior that it took him a long time to notice something truly strange. The reason he was brought here in the first place. They were walking through the bed in the middle of the room. Not just over it or around it, but straight through it as if it wasn't there. But wait, something else was wrong too. There weren't 12 of them in the room. It was closer to 20. Had he miscounted a moment ago? Then he saw it take place. One of the cadavers reached the edge of the room and paused, as if in thought. At that moment, it split. Not in half, but rather two versions of itself emerged from where one had been standing, both walking in different directions. A thrill of excitement ran through Professor Davies' body. The uncertainty principle. It was there in action in front of him. He was looking at Schrodinger's cat inside the box and seeing both its corpse and its living self. Where uncertainty exists, this entity was somehow embodying both possibilities in real time. He watched the two selves walk around the room, following different paths for several minutes, until eventually they converged again back into one being. He turned to the researcher accompanying him, lit up with excitement, and asked what they were doing here. The researcher's face was grim when he replied, They're pacing, waiting. The airlock door hissed open. He felt the stale 1800s air hitting his face, perfectly maintained at 20 degrees. In front of him was the garden path, leading up to his goal, that glass bubble. Gripping the satchel, he set off up the path slow enough not to attract any unwarranted attention. Over the next few days, Professor Davies learned everything that the Foundation had on SCP-001. It had been a human once, a radical physicist born in the late 19th century. Intent on kickstarting the next century with a nuclear renaissance, the young man had created a working model for stable nuclear fusion. The potential ramifications were enormous, free, clean electricity on a mass scale with no harmful byproducts. His research was almost complete when a covert private military group poisoned him with his own radioactive nuclear agent. The young man made it back to his house, where he died in his sleep that night. Powerful military personnel and prominent scientists who had been working alongside the young man knew immediately what had happened. Bursting into his home, they were about to walk through his bedroom door and save him when they saw the shadow of two feet standing by the door, then another pair. The young scientist had died, but he also hadn't. Much like Schrodinger's cat, the man was suspended in a dual state of death and not death. This shocking discovery led the group of people present to form a rudimentary foundation, established to secure and contain their once friend within his room, never to be discovered by the wider world. Through close observation since this time, it has been established that SCP-001 exists independently of linear time, in a kind of superposition relative to the world around it. It is capable of occupying any space that will or has been empty at any point in time. Say you have two chairs in a room. One chair has always been there. The other was added to the room just five minutes before. The SCP is unable to walk through the chair that was always there since it has always existed. But the chair that was added can be passed through with no problem, because there was a point in time when that chair had not been there. But it also works in the future. If a third chair was present, which had always been there, but was removed five minutes after the experiment, SCP-001 could pass through that chair also. The Foundation theorizes and hopes that the start of this clock that SCP-001 operates on was the point at which the young scientist died and did not die. 
That is why it is incapable of escaping its bedroom, and that is why it is of vital importance that the bedroom door remains closed forever. Ongoing maintenance work and preservation techniques are being employed to keep the house in as stable a state as possible. Should anything happen to damage the integrity of the structure, the quantum chaos contained in that space could lead to a total breakdown of the laws of physics, destroying not just the world but the fundamentals of mathematics as we know them. The bomb bumped against Professor Davies' thigh as he walked up to the house, an old man whose life had been devoted to denying the world its future. A reality where what is and what could be are just as real as one another. A world where the pain of living in the now fades, when you can travel to any moment in your life and relive its joy, when you aren't trapped by the aging process. Infinite renewable energy to solve the world's problems, a chance to see your deceased loved ones again, a way to look at the universe through the eyes of God. The head of 001 Containment, he had spent his entire career overriding all of the safeguards, tweaking containment rules just enough each year all so he could walk across this grass with a satchel on his shoulder and an explosive more important than the atomic bomb at his hip. He approached the glass of the inner sphere. If he had done the math right, this should do just enough damage to create a hole in the containment structure. The pressure change wouldn't be too great inside, but it should be just enough to blow, say, a bedroom door wide open. Step right up, folks! We've got all kinds of refreshing and tasty treats here for you today! Popcorn, peanuts, cotton candy, and even fried dough! Yes, sir, here at SCP Explained, we're offering the top-of-the-line anomalous delectable foodstuffs for all your circus-themed fun-time occasions! And that's because today, yes, today, on this YouTube platform, our infamous acronym doesn't stand for Secure, Contain, Protect. It stands for Sweet Confectionery Products. And let me tell you, dear viewer, the SCP we're looking at today just might be the most decadent, durable, and dangerous dessert that's ever desired to be devoured. We're talking about SCP-3077, or as they are better known, the Sugar Golems. These little fellas are safe class and are so totally harmless, so long as you take the proper precautions. What's the matter, don't you believe me? Don't you think it's nice of us to cover a safe SCP now and again? And hey now, why all this dull talk about rules and regulations in the first place? You don't go out to the carnival to not take wild and exciting risks. Every spinny, twirly, and whirly ride on the fairgrounds comes with a statistically higher chance of a tragic mishap befalling you and any other thrill seekers around you. But we all take that chance anyway for the extraordinary rush of the experience. And such is the wacky and wonderful ways of our adorable and questionably edible chums, the sugar golems. Don't you just love them, folks? Ain't they a sight for sore eyes and a pang for sweet teeth? Well, we're only just getting started. The best is yet to come, ladies and not ladies. So pull up a chair and be sure to watch what we've got in store. You can make like a piece of old candy and stick around. Now that's a knee slapper, ain't it? <laughs> Sit back, relax, and make sure to enjoy the show. You should also subscribe to SCP Explained if you'd like to continue to be entertained. Hey, that rhymed! What do you know? I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. Ha! <laughs> Out roll. While SCP-3077 refers to the anomalous substance contained in Site-81, the semi-humanoid instances, which are nicknamed sugar golems, are themselves an animate and independent byproduct that naturally spawns from SCP-3077 when it is allowed to exist outside of containment procedures. The most important of these containment procedures being that SCP-3077 must remain at a constant temperature of well below its freezing point and only be stored in containers full to capacity, lest its aforementioned byproducts attempt to breach containment. The total volume of SCP-3077 within the cryogenic containment unit equals almost 2200 liters, and it is believed to be the only known quantity of the anomalous substance in existence. For the sake of clarity in distinguishing between SCP-3077 and its byproducts, we'll be referring to the main object contained by the Foundation as SCP-3077, while the gooey little guys who we know to spontaneously split off from the source of SCP-3077 will be regarded as SCP-3077-1. As mentioned before, SCP-3077-1 instances have been affectionately dubbed the Sugar Golems. Every instance of SCP-3077-1 resembles an approximately one meter tall gaunt humanoid composed of a pure sugar-derived substance 
commonly known as treacle. And that's molasses for all y'all yeehaw cowboys over there in the US of A. If you've ever played the classic board game Candyland, you'll have some idea of what an individual instance of SCP-3077 looks like from the beloved and often remembered character of Gloppy, who lives in the molasses swamp section of the board and is also fittingly made out of molasses himself. Yes, indeed, Gloppy is truly a delight for a weary Candyland player to meet. What did you say? Are you folks too young to know about Candyland? Well, that factoid certainly makes this narrator feel pretty old. Then again, I am taking on the mannerisms and attire of an old-fashioned carnival barker, so I suppose a bit of novel antiquity comes with the territory. Regardless, the golems are each composed of roughly seven liters of sweet, syrupy goodness. And very much like everyone's favorite character, Gloppy, they all lack defined lower bodies and can all emote through crude yet oddly endearing vocalizations in the place of intelligible speech. While their facial features are simplistic and misshapen, the contours of concave eyes and gaping mouth are usually present. The exact number of these eyes and mouths is subject to variation, much like the color of the board spaces in a wonderful wholesome family game of Candyland. While each SCP-3077-1 instance is around the same size, the body proportions and overall shape of each instance are rather fluid, pun fully intended. Some possess oversized arms or bulbous heads, while others might be conjoined to an adjacent sugar golem, as if to show that the two are inseparable as a pair of best buddies. Or, as some others might put it, a couple of BFFFs, best friends for fancy frolicking. They really are quite friendly looking, aren't they? And aren't they, they sure are. For the only thing that these sugary sweet SCP instances want is to be in the company of human beings just like you. Yes, you! Who else would I be talking to? It's a hard life for this worn down Connie, let me tell you. These little sugar golems love what they do and do what they love. But that doesn't mean that it's time for fun and games. Even though SCP-3077-1 instances want to hang around human beings, they don't tend to stop at hey and hello or whatever those appropriate greetings sound like when they are being gurgled by a diminutive molten sugar monster. Things can get out of hand real fast. Just like an orange cream popsicle melting in the sun of a late summer's day. Now listen up, it's important that you pay attention to what I say next. I'm about to book learn you about what to do if an instance of SCP-3077-1 enters your personal space. The results of prolonged contact with this SCP can end badly if you're not careful. I'm not going to sugarcoat any of the chewy details of your grisly fate, and I promise that it won't be a cakewalk. So don't be a nerd and listen up. Yes, that's right, I called you a nerd. You know, like nerds, the candy. How do you folks seriously not know nerds? They were a classic Halloween candy from the Wonka Company, and they were very popular back in the day. Oh, what's that you say? How long ago was it back in the day for me? Uh, that's a bit of a rude question, wouldn't you say? Oh, why I oughta... Won't you go ahead and knock it off with the wise guy questions? What are you, a pack of smarties? Ha <laughs> ha, I said smarties, get it? It's just like the... Ah, never mind. Let's just move on to the explanation of how to survive a close encounter with this SCP. That was the main reason you came all this way to this here educational and entertaining video presentation after all. To pick up where I left off, instances of SCP-3077-1 have a tendency to seek out nearby human life. The reason for doing so is surprisingly simple and alarmingly, well, alarming. These sticky saccharine simulacra are solely set on slithering into people's mouths for the purposes of gaining total control of their bodies. Yes, you heard that right. Believe it or not, the same anomalous property which animates the sugar golem's treacle bodies is apparently capable of overriding the human nervous system from the inside. And that's no joke, folks. While these tasty treats might sound sweet to eat, you'll be a puppet of meat from your head to your feet if you don't complete the tasks I entreat. If an instance of SCP-3077-1 attempts to enter your mouth, you must remember first and foremost to keep your trap shut blocking it with a mask or a similar article of clothing if need be. Next, you must use your limbs and all available implements to batter the attacking golem away, while you do your best to keep a distance of at least arm's reach between yourself and the instance. It should come as a relief to our rational people that SCP-3077-1 instances are severely limited in their physical capabilities, and an adult human of average fitness can easily hold one off if they know what to expect. 
The tricky part comes from the amorphous properties of the instance's viscous treacle bodies, as well as their anomalous ability to regenerate from any physical trauma. The only way to permanently destroy an instance of SCP-3077-1 is to expose it to temperatures above its melting point, which for you sticklers out there is approximately 176 degrees Celsius. The most effective weapons against SCP-3077-1 instances include firebombs, flamethrowers, and your run-of-the-mill convection ovens. If it is at all possible to contain the instance within a sealed vessel such as a large Tupperware or wooden barrel, mm -hmm. then you ought to do whatever you can to prevent the candy creeps from running amok. While ordinary below zero temperatures are unable to destroy the anomalous treacle of SCP-3077, instances of SCP-3077-1 can effectively be slowed down or stopped completely if you put them on ice. Whether it's the hot foot or the cold shoulder, some form of extreme temperature should always be weaponized when defending oneself from an SCP-3077-1 instance. Any attempt to crush or smash an SCP-3077-1 instance will only result in the bad bonbon breaking apart and reforming into several more belligerent bite-sized blighters! A human under siege by the sugar golems might find themselves quickly outnumbered if they foolishly attempt to use a melee weapon against the anomalies. Basically, it's like a more delicious version of the popular arcade video game Asteroids. No? Eh, I guess that reference was from before even my time. At any rate, instances of SCP-3077-1 are difficult to destroy without access to heat or freezing. The tendency of the molasses menaces to increase in number is made even worse because of the fact that any amount of SCP-3077 outside of containment can generate a nearly infinite number of SCP-3077-1. While even an army of SCP-3077-1 instances is far weaker than an equivalent pack of hunting animals, the ability to continuously multiply and physiology that doesn't experience the consequences of fatigue means that, given enough time, the sugar golems can outlast any amount of human resistance until they roll over their preferred prey like a slow, insurmountable, syrupy tsunami of surrender! Seriously scary stuff, some would say. But what happens next is the real kicker, folks. Mind this ballyhoo's somber spiel. If an instance of SCP-3077-1 manages to, against all odds, clamber its way into a human chatterbox and hijack the poor sap's nervous system, the victim is immediately classified as SCP-3077-2. SCP-3077-2 instances are easily distinguished from unaffected humans on sight alone. Dark tendrils of SCP-3077 can be seen visibly moving beneath the skin, and often emerge from the mouth to crisscross the instance's face, like makeup, the world's most disturbing circus clown. That's not all! After the tragic treacly transformation takes place, the movements exhibited by the instance of SCP-3077-2 will become crooked and jerky like a marionette puppeteered by a frustrated chimpanzee! During this time, the instance remains fully conscious, retaining whatever cognitive faculties it has possessed previous to its classification, but it is unable to attempt speech or exert autonomy over its own actions. This fun fact was discovered by studying the EEG recordings of several SCP-3077-2 instances, and is brought to you by the United Guild of the Existentially Terrified. If an instance of SCP-3077-2 happens to wander its way into the vicinity of any humans that haven't succumbed to the process of consuming SCP-3077-1, it will proceed to put on a jaunty performance for its newfound audience. This peculiar display involves clumsy efforts at dance choreography and the throaty singing of unsettling atonal melodies that would make your annoying cousin's road trip song sound like they're in tune. These awkward performances continue until the audience departs from the view of SCP-3077-2 instance, or the instance expires. This confirms that the point of the gesture is to entertain, as without an audience, the SCP-3077-2 instance is not compelled to make any noises of its own accord, and in general doesn't do anything other than move around aimlessly. In the event that any number of SCP-3077-1 instances escapes from containment, and causes the creation of SCP-3077-2, members of the Mobile Task Force are instructed to never stray from the line of sight of a currently performing SCP-3077-2 instance, and to approach it steadily, before restraining the instance while causing minimal harm to the body. 
SCP-3077-2 instances can be useful for running further tests on the anomalous properties of SCP-3077, and there are simple procedures that allow an instance to be kept alive indefinitely in containment. Any damage sustained during capture can severely hamper the efficiency of these life-sustaining procedures. The worst case scenario is that an SCP-3077-2 instance expires before being securely contained, as this will cause the SCP-3077-1 instance to emerge from its host and resume its relentless attack on all nearby humans. It is far easier to simply deal with SCP-3077-2 instances accordingly, and this is because SCP-3077-2 only ever attempts to continue the performance and possesses neither the intention nor the capacity for retaliation. If it is deemed necessary for the effectiveness of a recapture effort, it can be permissible for the Mobile Task Force to allow instances of SCP-3077-1 outside of containing to find purchase within SCP-3077-2 to increase the ease of containment and lessen the risk of Foundation personnel being affected. The performances of SCP-3077-2 instances are rarely physically intensive enough to make capture too difficult, but it can be said that the whimsical antics of these affected humans are anything but predictable. During some rare and special performances, and if the SCP-3077-1 instance in control of SCP-3077-2 instance is feeling especially daring, it may try to show off an array of woefully inadequate acrobatic skills. Front flips that are more like belly flops, back flips that could be mistaken for pratfalls, and the sort of type road pan trapeze acts that are better left to the imagination. In lieu of prior incidents, the Foundation strongly advises that if for any reason an instance of SCP-3077-2 must exist in containment, it must always be prevented from being at an altitude of more than six feet from the surface of the floor, especially if any humans it would perceive as an audience are located directly beneath where its performance would take place. Regarding the creation of further instances of SCP-3077-2, requests from any level of Foundation personnel at Site-81 or elsewhere must be granted permission to proceed by SCP-3077's head researcher because of the horrific implications of what happens to the still-aware human mind while the body is affected by SCP-3077-1. This process is only to be approved for use on D-Class personnel. That's right! And even then, in the event that all the rigmarole of the paperwork goes through, it is not acceptable to create an instance of SCP-3077-2 merely for the purpose of providing live entertainment to fellow researchers. After all, not a single one of us should be quick to forget the grotesque and highly regrettable spectacle that was Dr. Dietz's deplorable D-Class dancers. Every researcher involved with that ethical nightmare was reprimanded severely and the colorful novelty costumes and jangling bells that all former D-Class personnel were made to wear after being reclassified to SCP-3077-2 have been permanently confiscated. Let the cotton candy machine and peanut dispenser located just outside the containment unit of SCP-3077 serve as a stern reminder that there's a time and place for monkey shines and tomfoolery, and sometimes, yes, even now and then, a highly secure Foundation facility is neither the right place nor the right time. In case you haven't picked up on it, there are very few practical applications of SCP-3077 due to the fact that its status as a food dish is negated by the consequences of consumption. The main reason for tests to be administered on SCP-3077-2 instances is to discover if there is a safe method of extracting an SCP-3077-1 instance from the body of its host without causing the expiration of the original human. Unfortunately, due to a persistent lack of success, the experiments have been discontinued indefinitely. But that just won't do. How else are we supposed to know if these things actually taste as good as they look? I won't rest until everyone is able to harmlessly ingest a sugar golem of their very own. I might be old-fashioned, but to me, the safe object class isn't just a designation, it's an invitation. I ought to be completely okay doing whatever I like around a safe object because it's safe. That word should actually mean something. Ding, ding, darn it. And I don't mean that in the sense that the SCP Foundation uses it, meaning an anomaly that doesn't present an active threat to containment efforts. And more importantly, there aren't that many anomalies that are also delicious candy. And I want to eat this one. Sorry, 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 I lost my cool of it there. 
I just have a sweet tooth, and my brain is constantly drifting back to my nostalgic childhood memories of playing Candyland with my family. That was before they all decided that they wanted nothing to do with me because I became so obsessed with dressing up like a carnival barker that I drove away everyone who's ever cared about me. Other than that, my job here at the Foundation explaining confectionery SCPs is the only thing I have left in my sad, sad life. Some days I feel less like Gloppy and more like a real Lord Licorice. In hard times like these, a fellow could really use some entertainment to cheer himself up. Wait, just a flea jumping moment! What was that? What's the big idea? How did these escaped instances of SCP-3077-2 get in here? They're all supposed to be in safe containment a few floors down! Did somebody else from the research team let them in here because they knew I was in costume standing in front of a pretend fairground set? That's in pretty poor taste, don't you think? Pun very much intended. I should probably report it to the head researcher. That would be the ethical, reasonable thing to do. Then again, look at them go. Those are sure some hilarious dances. I'm definitely seeing a snappy attempt at doing the Charleston, a classic. And is that one doing the worm or is it just kind of flopping on the floor? I think one of these instances knows about that Fortnite stuff all the kids are into these days, but I'm not sure if the human element or the golem that decides what dances it knows. Either way, this was exactly what I needed to feel so much better. For once, it feels like I'm actually at a carnival instead of just pretending to be at one now. This is the greatest performance I've ever seen in all my years, which you can be sure that there have been a lot of. The diver screams a silent scream as the giant squid's beak digs into his skin, its many grasping tentacles grabbing him and holding him in place. Nearby, his fellow divers are driven half mad with terror as they see mysterious figures floating towards them through the murk and strange Russian voices speaking in their heads. Nobody can help them. They're down too deep, too consumed by the darkness and the pressure of the sea. They're now at the mercy of whatever is inside the submarine. Beginning in the 1940s with the dawn of nuclear weapons, the American government conducting the world's first atomic weapons test and the Soviet Union responding in kind with nuclear testing of their own, the two powers entered an arms race fueled by rivalry and a thirst to prove their strength on the world stage. What followed were decades of staggering technological advancements as each nation tried to outdo and intimidate the other. The Soviet Union crossed into the cold reaches of outer space, deploying the satellite Sputnik. The United States responded with the founding of NASA. Tensions reached a fever pitch during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 as United States citizens feared they were teetering on the brink of nuclear war. In July of 1968, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States came together to sign the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, agreeing to abandon their pursuit of increasing nuclear power and turn their focus to disarmament. But several months before the treaty was signed, the Soviet government was dealing in weaponry far more dangerous than nuclear missiles something the other world powers knew nothing about. These deadly secrets were hidden aboard a submarine known as SCP-741. SCP-741 is the underwater wreckage of a Soviet submarine that sank in March of 1968 and came into the custody of the SCP Foundation in 1999. The submarine, a version of the Charlie II class, was deployed under unusual circumstances, which attracted the attention of the United States government. In an attempt to learn more about the submarine, the US government launched Project Redacted, which attempted to recover the vessel from the ocean in the early 1970s. They managed to recover a few pieces of the vessel, though the specifics are highly classified. In the late 1990s, the US government contacted the SCP Foundation, informing them of a possible Euclid or Keter class anomaly in the wreck. At this point, it passed into the custody and surveillance of the Foundation. The submarine is on the ocean floor, broken into three pieces. The hull was broken into bits during Project Redacted recovery attempt, but was largely intact when it first sank except for two holes, one just in front of the sail and one just below the starboard missile tubes. Apparently the vessel sank rapidly due to flooding after an enemy missile strike, which occurred while it was surfacing. Though all parts of the submarine are accounted for, no members of the crew have been located. Additionally, none of the emergency escape equipment on board has been used, raising further questions about what became of the crew. Wherever they went, they seem to have left something behind. 
Whenever divers are sent down to investigate the wreckage, they report experiencing anomalous currents and strange sea life, and hearing moans, disembodied voices, and incoherent whispering. They also report seeing blurry, faintly glowing figures. Additionally, the ocean life in the area is unnaturally aggressive, particularly large squid and sharks. This effect was first noted during a manned expedition into the waters around the wreckage, described in Incident Report 1741-A. Divers A26 through A30 embarked from the icebreaker Yamal into the waters below with the intention of studying the potential anomalous activity surrounding the wreckage. As the group of divers approached the submarine, they could feel the shift in the water around them. The oppressive feeling of abnormally increasing pressure bearing down and threatening to crush them. If their specialized diving equipment were to fail, they knew that that would be it, and the command would have to come and fish their corpses out of the water. Or even worse, they would vanish entirely, meeting the same mysterious fate as the crew of that doomed submarine. But they couldn't fixate on that. They had a job to do. At first glance, the wreckage appeared undisturbed, unchanged since the previous inspection. Still, they needed to take a closer look to be sure. As the team got closer to the vessel, A-30 was startled by the sight of movement from within the wreckage, spotting motion through one of the holes in the structure as something passed by. He pointed it out to his colleagues, but they dismissed it as likely a giant isopod or spider crab, which were crawling all over the surrounding area. A-30 laughed off his jumpiness, agreed that they were probably right, and continued the exploration as planned. Control authorized the divers to proceed to the next step, and A-29 activated sonar and lights, moving toward the starboard side breach. There, a faint glowing caught his eye. The glow resembled that of radioactive material, but when the team checked the radiation levels in the area, they remained stable. Whatever the source of the glow was, it wasn't radioactive. At this point, his neutron counter began to register something, and all of a sudden, a disembodied voice could be heard saying, Vasily Yevgeny, can you hear me? The voice was muffled, and though it could be heard over their communication channels, it emanated from somewhere in the wreckage, deep, deep underwater. As A-29 watched, a glowing shape emerged from the darkness. It was only an outline, the suggestion of a silhouette, but the shape was undeniably familiar. It looked like a person. The other divers quickly noted the apparition too and began to panic. Some checked their nitrogen levels, believing it to be some sort of nitrogen narcosis, while others pointed out that they couldn't all be suffering from nitrogen narcosis at the same time. The unknown voice continued speaking, saying, Help me, it is getting hard to breathe. The divers debated what to do next, questioning whether what they were seeing was even real, when all at once, the humanoid figure vanished from sight. The divers attempted to shake off the startling encounter, and they resumed their duties, the investigation proceeding as normal. After a few moments of uneventful work, another interruption presented itself in the form of a five-meter-long squid swimming around the wreckage. Its presence startled the divers at first, particularly those closest to the animal, but the others encouraged them to ignore it, citing the fact that there are no records of these squid attacking humans. So they did, continuing their work as the squid circled them with apparent curiosity. A-27 spotted an unusual shell below the wreckage, notably large and difficult to identify, and Control requested that they bring it up to the surface for further inspection by a marine biologist. The diver began attaching haul cables to the shell as the squid crept closer and closer. All of a sudden, A-26 screamed, and there was a sudden bloom of blood in the water. The squid, despite it being uncharacteristic behavior for its species, attacked the diver, biting him savagely. Prompted by cries for help from the diving team, Control began to reel A-26 back towards the surface, proceeding slowly to give him decompression time, and the squid took advantage of the slow retreat. It chased after the diver, grabbing hold of him and biting down again, tearing away at him as it gripped him in its tentacles. Still, Control continued reeling him in, hoping to free him from the squid's grasp as they yanked him to the surface. The other divers were ordered to get themselves out of there as fast as possible, an order they gladly obeyed. As they swam back to the surface, A-30 saw something else moving in the depths. He couldn't make out what it was, but the sight of it gave him a sick feeling of dread deep in the pit of his stomach. The four divers were recovered alive, along with the shell. 
Examination of the shell indicated that it resembled that of the extinct orthoconic nautiloids, but it was not fossilized. It was taken for further study, given the possible implication of extinct species anomalously manifesting in the vicinity of SCP-714. Diver A-26 lost a limb and was exposed to an unknown venom via bites from the attacking squid. His camera was destroyed in the process. As squid are not known to attack humans unprovoked, this behavior has been attributed to the influence of SCP-741, though the exact link between the two is yet to be determined. An anomalous pressure gradient surrounds the wreck with a radius of approximately 250 meters, starting around the center of the submarine. The pressure in this area is much greater than it should be, given the depth of the waters there. This unusually high pressure makes sonar analysis extremely difficult, as well as threatening the safety of any divers in the vicinity of the wreck. The few records that the Foundation has managed to obtain from the Russian and U.S. governments indicate that the submarine was being used to transport some sort of secret cargo. Though the specifics of this cargo are still unknown, there is reason to believe that it differed from any type of nuclear or chemical weaponry. On a date redacted from official files, the SCPS Basisti was patrolling the area around SCP-741 when its sonar detected some unknown entity approaching SCP-741 from the south at a pace of 46 knots. The crew compared the acoustic signature of the contact with known submarines and torpedoes, but could not find a match. The Basisti attempted to reach the contact via sonar buoy drops and active sonar pings, but it did not respond. When the contact crossed into the total underwater exclusion zone, it became classified as hostile. At that point, the sonar recorded sounds of an undersea missile launch, and Basisti responded with the utmost urgency. The ship broke away from its original area and fired a Type 53 torpedo at the underwater threat. Fifteen seconds after the Basisti launched its torpedo, missiles of an unidentified configuration were seen breaking the water, flying at a height of 1.8 meters and a velocity of 0.92 Mach. The missiles did not emit any detectable radar, nor did they respond to any launch chaff or flares from the Basisti. Both of the missiles were engaged by Basisti's 3KN5 Kinsol surface-to-air missiles and Kashtan point defense systems, and were destroyed at 1,800 meters and 210 meters from impact, respectively. After the missiles were neutralized, the hostile vessel could be heard engaging in evasive maneuvers. At this point, there were four closely spaced explosions and the sound of a submarine disintegrating. The identity of the attacker, as well as its intention toward SCP-741, have not yet been determined. The incident resulted in the Foundation research team suggesting an expansion of the acoustic sensor net, as well as additional patrol and defense assets placed in the area. Additionally, they advised an acquisition of undersea retaliatory capability. The incident was classified Incident 1741-C. The sonar recordings from the SCPS Basisti during Incident 1741-C were taken for further analysis by the research team. The in-depth review revealed anomalous acoustic signatures that did not match up with any known forms of propulsion, including magneto-hydrodynamic drive. Currently, the nature of the unidentified attacker remains a mystery, and it has not been attributed to any particular government or organization. Following the incident involving the SCPS Basisti, an American intelligence agent reached out to the Foundation, offering further insight into the secretive government programs looking into SCP-741. He agreed to sit for an interview with a Foundation researcher assigned to the project, on the condition that his identity remain protected. The SCP researcher's name is absent from the official file as well. The two men sat in a Foundation interview room, and the interviewer asked his informant why he chose to come forward, given the U.S. government had simply chosen to sit on this information for 30 years. You've seen those reports. Project redacted. Now we know that part too. How the directors didn't make the connection is beyond me. That and the stuff the redacted pulled up? Yeah, the other part you don't hear about is what some of the research team died of. And the crewmen we buried? Just uniforms. Also, the nuclear device we recovered wasn't a missile or torpedo warhead. It was a demolition charge. Does that make any sense? After all those clues, I had to come forward. Why the director didn't is something I can't fully explain. This particular statement puzzled the Foundation researcher, raising questions he hadn't anticipated. Only uniforms? Did this mean that the sub had been unmanned? The informant replied, no, no, not unmanned. There were no bodies, but personal effects were everywhere, along with uniforms. There was some blood, human, 
Before you ask, on one of the torpedoes and a bit of skin where somebody probably crushed his hand load in the thing. Just no bodies left. When I first looked into all this, I had no clue what the hell had gone on down there, but I started putting things together. The Foundation agent began to speculate based on the mounting evidence. Could it have been a Soviet weapons program? A deadly biological agent of some kind? No, no, it wasn't that. I thought maybe it could have been, so I dialed up some of my contacts at BioPreparent. Our spies wind up owing each other favors after a while, and they denied it vehemently. Not your usual cover-up baloney either, they clearly stated that whatever the sub was carrying, it wasn't theirs. They wanted no part of it. Sound like he was gonna puke when I mentioned Redacted. Doctor, do you have any idea what it takes to make a bioweapons researcher sick? Now that wasn't what really bugged me though. What really kept me awake at night was the KGB file that fell into our hands. They mentioned a covert op by the Soviet military against an internal unnamed faction to get rid of a quote, terrifying weapons that even the Soviet Union can't safely control. They wanted to lose it, whatever it was, or maybe fob it off onto the US. Of course, that all came to light right before the Iron Curtain fell, and given the atmosphere at the time, it was practically impossible to convince the directors that they weren't talking about nukes, and even once I did, they still didn't even think this was worthy of action. I mean, the redacted would probably have me hang for treason if they ever find me, but it was worth the risk. And by what I can gather, sounds like Russia thinks so too. Loaning you half the Pacific fleet and all. The interview continued after this point, but the rest of the conversation was considered irrelevant and stricken from the official file. The interview left the Foundation with more questions than answers, though they were more certain than ever that SCP-741 must be kept under strict containment procedures. Due to the object's location at the bottom of the sea, as well as the unusually elevated pressure around it, it is unlikely that many civilians will come into contact with it. However, as an extra protective measure, sonar and submersible monitoring is conducted on a periodic basis in order to verify that the wreckage has not been interfered with in any way. The Foundation contracted Russian warships, SCP Esposisti and Krasnoyarsk, has been selected for this purpose. If any unauthorized activity occurs in the area surrounding SCP-741, nuclear and conventional missiles may be deployed. Any movement of SCP-741 is grounds for an immediate nuclear strike. Whatever secrets SCP-741 holds, whatever it was transporting that was even more of an uncontrollable threat than nuclear warfare, they're better left alone down there, at the bottom of the sea. Nothing in life can prepare you for the raw heat of a house on fire. Throwing an arm up in front of his eyes and clasping a handkerchief to his mouth, Robert Chetford hacked up half of the contents of his lungs. Glancing at the material, he saw that his phlegm was black, poisoned by the smoke. A beam collapsed in front of him, sending a fresh wave of burning air into his face, so hot that it felt like it was going to scorch his ears off. He had to run, he had to get out of the house, but he knew he couldn't. His mother was upstairs. Robert barreled his way through the flames, shouldering open doors and stumbling along hallways. The air was so thick with smoke that he could barely breathe, so he collapsed to the floor and started to crawl on his stomach. He reached the first step of the grand staircase and started to heave himself up one at a time, feeling the heat of the house threatening to engulf him more with every inch he climbed. But he hadn't made it more than five steps before there was an enormous creaking sound, and the whole staircase collapsed beneath him. Sparks rushed up into the air and swirled around the room. Flames licked at the walls all around him. As Robert looked around at the collapsed staircase, he knew that it was hopeless. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he pushed himself forward and ran out of the house. The firemen swarmed past him, filling the building and shouting to one another, but Robert just stood there, staring up at the top floor window. On the other side of the glass, surrounded by billowing smoke, he looked up at his mother, sitting as she always did on her rocking chair, utterly motionless as the house burned around her. In an undisclosed facility in the United States of America, you will find what may well be the lowest security containment cell in the entire SCP Foundation. There is no heavily armored door, no bulletproof glass, no machine guns about to drop down from the ceiling at any point. In fact, there's very little in the way of containment at all. They often leave the door to the cell wide open. There is a window, 
but on the other side of it isn't a crowd of researchers, security guards, and agents ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. It's just a normal double-glazed window that looks out across a vista of fields, trees, and a couple of power lines. Facing the window is an old armchair in which the concrete man sits, SCP-014. He spends all of his day, every day, staring out of the window. This view specifically was chosen because very little changes in it. Night turns to day, the trees change with the seasons, and it rains occasionally. But there are no roads, no new buildings springing up, nothing to distinguish it from how it looked in 1937. Beside him is a small table, home to a record player. In the corner of the room, there's an antique set of shelves that house three dozen old records, all dated from the 1930s or earlier. All day, every day, the music plays out of the old speaker. Every so often, as researchers walk up and down the corridor, if they hear that there isn't any music playing, they'll come into the room and change the record over for a new one. The newest researchers check in with SCP-014 to see if he's okay. He rarely responds, and so before long, they stop asking. You would think, therefore, that the concrete man is elderly, approaching the twilight years of his life. But the man who sits there in his chair, staring out of the window and listening to music from almost 100 years ago, appears to be just 30 years old. Friends of Robert Chetford reported a noticeable change in his demeanor following the fire and death of his mother. He had lost his father not long before to a workplace accident. William Chetford had been a construction worker, climbing up the girders of New York's emerging skyline, pouring concrete and piling bricks. He had been working on a new building, one that was said to be the tallest in the world called the Empire State Building. Day after day, he would climb the cranes, teeter precariously over the dizzying drops, any slight mistake, and he would plummet hundreds of feet, often to the busy streets below. Sure enough, one day, William Chetford's worst fears came to life. He was walking on a gangplank that wobbled and bent with every step he took. On his shoulders was a metal bar with a bucket of concrete dangled precariously from each tip. He walked this route every day, but clearly, that day proved too much for the wood to take. The board splintered and split beneath him, plunging him down and down through the scaffolding. William desperately reached out an arm and managed to grasp the edge of a girder. He hung there helplessly, staring up at his colleagues high above him. He cried out for help, and upon seeing him, they began to scramble down level by level to try and rescue him. He just needed to hang on for a moment longer, and they would rescue him. But one of them knocked over a bucket of concrete. William Chetford could do nothing but watch as the heavy sludge slowly tumbled towards his face. He tried to dodge it, but it was no use. The company told Mrs. Chetford that this had been William's saving grace, that he had been unconscious for the long fall down to the streets below. His fellow workers knew that this wasn't the case. They heard his screams all the way down. Mrs. Chetford didn't believe any of it. They were lying, all of them. The company, his co-workers, everybody. She knew what had really killed him. It was the same thing that was killing her slowly. The same thing that had been passed on to their son, concrete poisoning. She'd approached the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and any outlet she could, but none of them were remotely interested in the story. There were chemicals in the concrete. It wasn't safe to use. It never had been. She'd been working in nursing homes and seen the effects of concrete on construction workers. They'd become paralyzed, unable to move, spending so many years breathing concrete air, letting it absorb into their skin. Their bodies had slowly started to turn into it. She knew it. She started to go crazy, pinning up news clippings, medical journals, photographs, maps, anything she could find, all over her walls, her entire bedroom. She had red string hanging from the walls and ceiling connecting to every surface. Robert watched helplessly from the doorway, unable to do anything as he saw his mother steadily entering into psychosis. But the further her paranoia went, the less energy she seemed to have for it. Weeks went by, and her manic fervor was replaced with lethargy. She got slower and slower in her movements, talked less and less at mealtimes, and began to sit down for extended chunks of the day. Robert, assuming that she was tired from grief, did what he could to help. He carried an armchair up to her room and placed it in the corner by the window so that she could look out over the world around her. He thought she was resting, 
but it soon became apparent that she wasn't really resting. She was withdrawing, almost freezing over. Desperate to try and get his mother to re-engage with the world, Robert sat down with her to try and understand all of her conspiracy theories around his father's death. She explained slowly and calmly that the concrete being used in New York was poisoned, cursed. She didn't know where it had been dug up from, how it had been mixed, or who was behind it, but she was getting close. Maybe it was the US government. Maybe it was the same witches. Maybe it was God himself. But she knew her husband, and she knew he wouldn't have fallen that day. He had walked across that plank thousands of times without incident. There was no way he would have made that mistake. Robert tried to connect the dots of what she was saying. Did she really think that it was the concrete that had killed his father? She said that it was and that the same concrete is now killing her. She showed him her hands, turned them over front and back under the light for him to inspect. They looked just like normal hands, elderly, wrinkled, with deep veins popping out, but normal. She scratched at them and tried to feign pain for the effects of her fingers. Look, she said, you see that powder coming off of them? That's concrete powder. But Robert didn't see any of it. The concrete man came to the Foundation's attention a couple decades ago. Construction workers in New York in the late 1990s were hard at work clearing out the foundations for a new skyscraper. The site was built on top of what used to be a residential block, but one intrepid builder soon discovered something that shook him to his core. There was an old cellar beneath where the building used to be. The lock on it was heavy, thick with rust, and had been open for close to 70 years. He and his team managed to pry it open, put on their flashlights, and went inside. What they found was a basement apartment still sitting there beneath the rubble. It was a relic of its time. Thick dust covered every surface, ugly wallpapers surrounded them, and ancient appliances covered with rust sat in the kitchen. It was almost like walking through a haunted house. The builders joked about ghosts stalking these corridors as they made their way through, until they reached the bedroom. Sliding the door open, they faced a man sitting there, staring at them from an old armchair. The four burly builders screamed like little girls for a split second, then burst out laughing when they realized that the man wasn't real. He must have been a waxwork or something. He was sitting so perfectly still and hadn't reacted at all to their presence. They went over to inspect what he was made out of. They tapped on his forehead, lifted his arms and dropped them, and were surprised at how convincing the fake man was. That was, of course, until he politely asked them not to touch him. This time, they really did scream like girls, running straight out of the basement into a local police station. This basement apartment was where Robert Chetford moved following the fire in his parents' home and the death of his paralyzed mother. Racked with guilt, he had never been quite able to process what had happened to cause his mother's mental state to deteriorate so rapidly. By the time she died, she had been looking at her hands and genuinely believed they were made of concrete. She would not move, she would not eat, she would not sleep. For days, she would just sit, staring out of her window. He knew he should have taken her to a doctor, but they just couldn't afford it. Maybe if he had, this would have all worked out differently. Robert would think about it hour after hour. He would sit down in the armchair in the corner of his room and ponder what had happened. It was difficult to keep track of time living in the basement. There were no windows, no daylight at all, but he didn't think he had been sitting there for very long when he noticed the skin on his hands starting to turn gray. Without panic, he slowly lifted his hands to his eyes and inspected what was happening. His fingers, down to about halfway through his palms, were dry and solid. He could move them just about, but it took a normal effort, and he could see cracks running along the back of the concrete when he did, so he decided not to. He wouldn't say he felt calm exactly, maybe disconnected. He didn't feel particularly hungry, he didn't feel particularly tired, in fact, he didn't feel much at all. His concrete limbs were only a passing curiosity to him as he sat in his chair. Very occasionally, he would get up to put on a record on his record player, then return to his seat and stare at the wall. That would be every couple of months at most. The rest of the time, he would just sit there. One day, he noticed in a vague corner of his mind that the ground was shaking and dust was filling the room. The ripping sound of dynamite and the heavy stone just above his head told him that the apartment block towering over him had fallen down and almost come through his ceiling. Robert just sat there, unconcerned. Another day, some indeterminate time later, 
a group of builders came in dressed in peculiar, futuristic clothing, with bright yellow hats and reflective vests. They seemed rather startled to see him, though in truth he had little care for seeing them. What did perturb him was when a group of people claiming to be agents from the Foundation came into his room and carried him out. He didn't like the noise, didn't like the change. If he wanted to move, he would move. Not that he could, of course. He was now entirely made of concrete, but that was beside the point. These people put him in the back of a van and drove him across half of the United States. They wheeled him through brightly lit rooms and into a disgusting modern white box. They had done the courtesy of bringing his chair along and found a new record player for him, with a whole selection of albums lining a shelf on the wall. He would have appreciated it and said thank you to them, but he didn't really care. He wasn't present at all. This was, of course, due to the fact that he was made of concrete by this point. However, once he was sat in his chair and took in the sight in front of him, Robert Chetford felt a dull panic rising in his chest. They placed him at a window, just like he'd placed his dying mother in front of a window. He tried to clench his jaw, tried to move his hands, tried to cry out in fear and pain, but he couldn't. He was paralyzed. The smell of smoke filled his chest, choking him, torturing him as the memories of his burning household raged in his mind. He tried to scream. He tried to fight. He tried to do anything other than just sit there, but it was far too late for any of that. Good afternoon, Mr. Chetford, the researcher said, busying herself and putting on another album for him to listen to. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Anything I can do to make you more comfortable? The concrete man said nothing. The researcher patted him on the back of his hand. Made of concrete indeed. Looks just like regular skin to me, Mr. Chetford. I do wonder what's going on inside that head of yours. On her way out of the room, she glanced at his view from the window. Beautiful weather outside today, isn't it? Scorching, even. Gamma would never forget the horrific sight of SCP-5967. On the surface, she kept her nerve, cool and collected, her finger ready to squeeze the trigger as her weapon stayed trained on the entity. But deep down, it turned her stomach. After all, how is someone meant to react when they see a thing like that? A mess of flesh and eyeballs towering above them, staring back through more retinas than any living creature has. She did not yet know it, but she'd still be seeing that disgusting pillar of musculature and eyes in her nightmares for months to come. And still, it wasn't even the worst part of the incursion. Far worse than seeing the five-meter-tall eyeball totem, watching it blink its many lids at her, was witnessing what it had done to Alpha. Only moments before, Gamma's commanding officer had been in control of this situation, leading Mobile Task Force Lambda-5 into the Meadowlands of East Rutherford, New Jersey. The mission should have been a simple smash and grab, the same old boring story their team had lived through countless times before. Pick up a high-value target, the leader of yet another cult practicing an anomalous religion, and bring him in for questioning. Gamma never could have expected that things would go this badly. The task force had arrived to discover Caesar Winters, the leader of a sect of Fifths operating in New Jersey. When Lambda 5 discovered him, Winters and his followers, locals who were all members of a group known as the Commune, were standing in a circle around an instance of SCP-5967. Standing at around 5 meters in height, SCP-5967s were piles comprised of mostly musculature and organs that resembled eyeballs, human eyeballs. Despite lacking a mouth, vocal cords, or any other conventional methods of speech, these pillars could still very much communicate verbally, although they had little to say besides spouting phrases and principles associated with the fifthist ideology. Almost immediately, the plan to capture Winters had gone awry. It was almost like he expected the Foundation to arrive, like he knew they were coming. As the members of MTF Lambda 5 moved in, keeping Winters in their sights, the anomalous cult leader somehow turned the gaze of SCP-5967 onto Alpha. The team's field commander ordered Delta to open fire, taking out Caesar Winters in a single shot, but only for a moment. Another of the commune members kneeled over and began convulsing. A wound formed at the person's neck, and from it emerged Caesar Winter's face. It grew into a full-sized head, replacing that of the commune member, giving Winters a brand new body in moments. 
on Alpha's orders to stop Winters from hopping to more bodies, Gamma and the others in their team fired on the other cultists. Everyone was terminated. Fifteen seconds was all it took. Then they moved towards SCP-5967, and everything went wrong. The bodies started to convulse violently, as if some unseen hand was shaking them around like ragdolls. Gamma watched as they began to levitate, hoisted by their necks and floating towards the mobile task force. Not one of them knew what to do, keeping their rifles up and trained on the corpses. Each one folded in on itself, becoming compressed masses of muscle embedded with eyes. That was when the team lost Alpha. Something was happening to their leader. She had dropped her weapon and fallen to her knees. Immediately, Gamma moved in to help her commander, trying to pull her back to her feet, but Alpha was resisting, transfixed by SCP-5967. It's her. She is lost deep in the cosmos and is angry with us for not helping her find her way back. She will kill us all, lest we lie in our brains and see her for who she truly is. Gamma watched as her team leaders rushed towards the Pillar of Eyes and licked it. The floating orbs of flesh and eyes that had once been people suddenly hurtled towards the members of MTF Lambda 5 at high speed. Gamma dove clear at the vital moment, performing a tactical role and managing to narrowly avoid being struck. Beta wasn't so lucky. Ready to retaliate, Gamma raises a weapon to fire at the floating remains, only to hear Alpha ordering her to stop. She had stopped licking SCP-5967, but whatever influence had compromised the Mobile Task Force leader hadn't relinquished its hold over her. She grinned unnervingly as her eyes rolled back into her head. Don't you hear her voice? She is angry, but I can save you. I can save us. Let me show you, Alpha said, before charging at Gamma with her arms outstretched. In seconds before she could defend against her commanding officer, Gamma found herself pounced upon by Alpha. Grabbing a nearby rock, Alpha swung at her head and knocked Gamma's tactical helmet clean off. Pinning her down, possessed by some unknown anomalous entity, Alpha held open Gamma's eyelids and licked her eyeball. Gamma screamed in horror as Alpha looked up to the sky and yelled, I can see you! I can see everything now! The case of SCP-5967 is one of the stranger tales within the annals of the SCP Foundation's history. Their investigation that led to the discovery of these five-foot-tall pillars of eyes and muscle originally began with a different intention. The commune had been making waves in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, the kind of waves that had caught the SCP Foundation's attention. The two leaders of this apparent cult were Salem Steros and Caesar Winters, both of whom seemed to be able to use SCP-5967s to take control of the local residents' minds. Anyone that they affected could be controlled remotely by either Steros or Winters, with a seemingly unlimited range and no known way of relinquishing their control over an affected person. Amnestic treatments, hypnotherapy, none of the Foundation's usual methods had worked. Undercover Foundation operatives working secretly within the Lindhurst Police Department were the first to discover an instance of SCP-5967 right under their noses. Literally, the pillar of eyeballs seemed to have sprouted up right in the middle of the Lindhurst Police Station. The Foundation sent in containment teams to secure the area and administer amnestics to witnesses. But just how were Steros and Winters causing these monstrous musculature monoliths to appear? Well, the pair operated a radio show together, known as The Reality Sync. The Foundation agents within Lyndhurst had been unable to track down exactly where they were broadcasting from. However, after the SCP-5967 instance appeared within the police station, the answer seemed to present itself. During the building's reconstruction, tapes of their radio show were recovered, seeming to suggest that the pair had been utilizing anomalous means to broadcast the reality sync from within the station itself while keeping themselves concealed. The reality sync was a religious talk show, specifically focused on discussing elements of fithism with the audience and callers who phoned into Winters and Steros' hidden studio. What exactly is fithism? Well, there's no easy answer to that question, unfortunately. Other anomalous cults and religions at least have a core tenet or belief at their center. Sarcasism is the worship of disease and decay, while mechanites from the Church of the Broken God venerate technology. The beliefs of the Fifth Church are a little more interchangeable, however. 
They don't really have any defined theology or religious practices. Fifthism is often more just a collection of recurring ideas and motifs. The number five, stars, and the belief in an external cosmic god, often a malicious one. In fact, if there is a defining principle of Fifthism, it's that it's an anomalous way of thinking that it can't really be understood. Practitioners of Fifthism are concerned primarily with transcending reality as we perceive it. They are highly interested in entities and anomalies that can warp and shape reality, to the extent of even being fearful of such beings. A lot of Fifthists seek to not only spread their influence to others through any means necessary, including brainwashing, but also hope to transcend humanity to a higher plane of reality, the fifth dimension. There, in theory, a person would cease to be a human being, and wouldn't even really be akin to a god or powerful reality bender. Instead, they would become something more vague, a concept, unable to be fully defined or to exist in reality completely. Fifthists follow this goal, presumably with the intention of saving humankind from reality warping anomalies, and they'll use any infectious brainwashing methods at their disposal to bring as many people as they can into their way of thinking. This brings us neatly back to Caesar Winters and Salem Steros' radio show, The Reality Sync. This was the Communes, their particular sect of Fifthism's, way of spreading what they referred to as the truth. Based on the various fragmented cassette recordings of their show that the SCP Foundation were able to recover, both Steros and Winters believed in a many-armed goddess, referring to it as only she or her. They encouraged their listeners to pray to this entity and let her know that they were loyal to her. During one of their recovered broadcasts, the pair of Fifthist hosts were even able to prank call the SCP Foundation itself. One junior researcher Jones was contacted by the two men and ridiculed for his association with the SCP Foundation. But after a few jokes at junior researcher Jones's expense, Steros and Winters began to insidiously implant ideas of Fifthism in the researcher's head. They referred to this as giving Jones the truth, something they both intended to do for all of their listeners in order to save them. When asked what they really meant, Winters and Steros made vague allusions to the truth being an infinite knowledge that only she could bestow. Jones had no idea who she was meant to be. Our guiding light, our creator, Salem described, before adding, the very thoughts that should be infiltrating your head right now? It seemed that through this call, the two hosts had managed to successfully embed their fifthest concepts into the mind of junior researcher Jones, and they weren't about to stop there. During another call on their show, both hosts spoke with a Wallington, New Jersey resident named Wendy Ricefield, who was already a self-proclaimed fifthist. Steros and Winters talked Wendy through a ritual to learn the truth, involving her drawing sigils on the walls and floor of her home and lighting candles. The phone line picked up wet squelching noises coming from the other side, the splintering of wood, and Wendy screaming for help as she tried to run from her home, only for something to drag her back inside. Eventually, the Foundation made the executive decision to step in and deal with the situation in New Jersey directly. Steros and Winters' operation was getting out of hand. More and more people in the surrounding area were being brainwashed into believing in fifthest concepts and compelled to complete bizarre rituals. Sending a team in to apprehend the cult leaders, Foundation personnel discovered Salem Steros and numerous other members of the Commune. They had gathered at an instance of SCP-5967 that had manifested in Wallington, the same place that Wendy Ricefield had been from. Steros and his fifthest followers were discovered holding hands and standing in a circle around the anomalous pillar of eyeballs, as well as approaching it and licking SCP-5967. The members of the commune were rounded up, and most were sent to be kept in isolation at Site-9. However, Salem Steros was brought to Site-83 for questioning. Junior researcher Umar Hadid conducted an interview as to the exact nature of the goddess Her that Steros and Winters often referred to, and the anomalous rituals the pair had been involved with. Salem was less than cooperative. He demanded to be set free in the interest of saving people by spreading the truth with Caesar. However, he did reveal some key information about Her. According to Steros' claims, she was a goddess actively meddling with reality and influencing human actions. He told Hadid that if he killed the junior researcher right there, it would be because she willed it. 
Sometime before, both Salem and his cult co-leader Caesar had been stargazing in the Meadowlands, a remote field in East Rutherford. That's when they had allegedly heard her voice and being told the truth. This reality warping goddess was intending to return home, but that way was broken. So according to Steros, she needed their help. This was the reason he and Winters began creating instances of SCP-5967. The eyeball pillars apparently acted as beacons, like a GPS signal allowing her to come back. The pair and the rest of the commune were attempting to prove their loyalty to her, in the hopes that they would potentially be allowed to transcend reality, in accordance with the Fithis principle. Salem Steros was remained into SCP Foundation custody, and kept detained in a containment suite surrounded by three Scranton reality anchors. Shortly after, the members of MTF Lambda 5 were dispatched, heading to the location Steros had inadvertently revealed during his interrogation. Their mission was to arrest Caesar Winters, who remained at large after the leader of Lambda 5 was compromised. Eventually, Gamma was able to contact the Foundation, who sent a containment team as backup. They secured the surviving MTF operative along with the infected team leader, Alpha, and the instance of SCP-5967 on the scene. Gamma was offered medical treatment and presented with a silver lion badge for her efforts in the field, along with a two-week vacation as a reward. That did little to stop the nightmares, though. She wasn't the same, and neither was Alpha. After two long weeks of psychological screening, and no further hostile or anomalous activity, Alpha was interviewed by junior researcher Hadid. During their discussion, Alpha, real name Cassandra Sandy Danofsky, described that she could still hear voices in her head, rambling about the truth, fifism, and eyeballs. Amnestic treatment wasn't helping. Suddenly, someone within the Foundation played a clip of Caesar Winters' voice over the facility speakers, taken from one of his and Steros' radio broadcasts. It triggered an instant paranoid reaction from Sandy, followed by her opening her mouth and revealing something growing inside. Another eyeball. Some kind of post-hypnotic suggestion or other form of brainwashing had affected her, and she began exhibiting anomalous behavior. Tell me, Hadid, are you a fifthist now? She asked the junior researcher. Are you ready to see the truth? Hadid rushed out of the room, shutting the door behind him. Pacing around the room, Sandy started drawing strange sigils of unknown origin on the floor and walls, lighting a candle through anomalous means. Then there came a bright flash of light as a four-legged entity appeared and attacked Alpha. The two merged, causing her body to change until it was unrecognizable. Well, as human anyway. Standing in the interrogation room where Sandy had been standing, was a contorted mass of flesh and muscle, with multiple eyeballs staring out from it. She had turned into another instance of SCP-5967. They all had. They were people. Steros and Winters had made beacons out of living people. Now check out SCP-3760 Like a Doll's Eyes, and the iPods SCP-131 for more.